Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today is September 21st, and this is the Charlotte City Council zoning meeting. So I want to call the meeting to order for tonight. Um, this evening, the zoning meeting is being held as a virtual meeting in accordance with the electronic meeting statutes, which means that um, we have met all the requirements of notice, access, and minutes um, through electronic means. If you would like to watch um, our um, meeting tonight, you may do so on the government channel, the city's Facebook page, or the city's YouTube page. Um, I'm going to ask the council members to introduce themselves and followed by the staff members. And so I'm going to um, start as I'm Vi Lyles and I serve as mayor and we'll go right to the mayor pro tem. And then this is Julie, I'm uh, mayor pro tem and stripping at large. Braxton Winston at large. Mr. Eggleston. Oh, I thought we had some other at-large members. I'm Larkin Eggleston, representative from District 1. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Victoria Watlington, District 3. Ed Driggs, District 7. Good evening, Matt Newton, District 5. All right, is Renee there Johnson, anyone? In, I'm four. sorry. Ms. Johnson? Renee Johnson, District 4. Todd Bakari, District 6. Okay. Um, Mr. Mitchell is will be absent ten, tonight um, and will not be in attendance, and I have not heard from Ms. Ashmira um, yet, so I expect that she will log on at some point. Um, and I ha we have a custom as a city council that we begin our meeting with an invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. And our invocation is really intended to solemnize our own proceedings so that we um, understand the gravity of the work that we are doing. Um, we also recognize in our community there's a religious diversity, including those without religious faith. So we ask that you participate as you see fit, and tonight we will ask Council Member Newton to give our invocation. Following immediately after our invocation, Council Member Watlington will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Let us pray silently together, each of us according to our individual beliefs. Let us offer thanks for our daily bread and blessings for one another. Let us seek to be a source of hope for those in need and guide us in truth, fairness, goodwill, friendship, and concern for others. Let us, the council, give gratitude for our opportunity to serve our great city and give us the strength to make the right decisions. And let the feelings of love, kindness, and a well-directed yet gentle spirit always be reflected in all that we do. In this we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Council Member Newton. Um, our flag is posted um, to, our, to my left. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, everyone. So, as required, um, we have a review of our zoning process um, just to make sure that everybody understands the rules because we've got a very long agenda with over 40 items to um, get through this evening. First, the process begins with applications that are submitted to the planning staff. And so right now I'd like to actually ask our planning staff to introduce themselves as well as others. So um, Ty, will you start? Good evening, Mayor and Council and community. My name is Taiwo Jayoba, Planning Director and uh, City Manager's Office. Good evening, everyone. Dave Patton, Rezoning Program Manager for the City. Good evening. Lakeisha Hall with Charlotte Department of Transportation. Ms. Jackson. Well, I was going to quickly introduce our new uh, staff, Robin Bias, and some of you may be familiar with Robin. She's not a stranger to our region, and um, having worked as a town plan, uh, as a planner, really, for a number of um, municipalities. But Robin joined us recently, and she's our new CDOT, Land Development Division Manager. She has a PhD in urban regional analysis with 15 years combined experience in planning, transportation, and municipal management along the East Coast. 
Uh, she's a great addition to CDOT, and we'll be working very closely with uh, Lakisha and also Dave Petten on our rezoning process. We're excited that she's here, and I'm personally happy she's here because she's my friend. So happy to have you all. Welcome. We will um, look forward to your continued expertise, and, um, and hopefully you'll enjoy the um, time on Monday nights. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Pretty strange if you do. It would be strange, right? That's exactly right. Um, so before we move on, um, I wanted to just walk through um, the process where we have um, two types of um, items on our agenda. First, we hear decisions, and then we have hearings. The decisions are on cases for which a public hearing has previously been held, and we do not receive any additional public comment. If you are um, here for a hearing or watching for a hearing, um, we've asked to have the city clerk register the, or everyone to want, that chooses to speak by 9 a.m. this morning, I believe. And so we already have um, our list of um, speakers. Um, we have the first thing in our hearings is a staff presentation, and then that is followed by the petitioner and those in favor, and they have three minutes to present their case for the petition. However, if their opponents sign up to speak or if the staff is in opposition, and I didn't notice that the staff had any, had any in opposition tonight. So if there are opponents sign up to speak, the petitioner gets 10 minutes, the opponents get 10 minutes combined, and the petitioner gets a two-minute rebuttal. If no one is opposed or signed up to speak, the staff will give a short presentation, the public hearing is closed, and we'll move to the next item. At the end of this meeting, um, of the end of our meeting, it, the process continues. The petition and the information tonight is, goes to the Zoning Committee of the Planning Commission for review and recommendation. The Planning Commission has two committees, a Planning Committee and a Zoning Committee, and I'd like to recognize um, Kimba Samuel, who is representative of the Zoning Committee, and Ms. Samuel will um, introduce the members of her team. I think we had a challenge getting Kiba the, the link, so Ms. Samuel may not be on the WebEx with us. I know she's viewing uh, with the other members of the Zoning Committee, but she may not be on currently. All right, so um, you can find the list of um, the Zoning Committee members on our website char at charlottenc.gov. Um, and we, as a part of our process, we realized that um, after about 10 o'clock, um, it's very difficult for us to keep clarity around um, the process. So we, convene, we, we recess at 10 o'clock if we have had um, too many speakers or too many um, items to follow up on. And any item that's deferred will go to the next business meeting, which is September the 28th. Um, today, in addition to that, um, we have some deferrals that I'd like to have a motion taken on. Item number four, seven, and nine. I'm sorry, four, three, four, and seven. Um, so moved. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion of those items for deferral? They will be deferred till October the 19th. Hearing no discussion, we do a roll call vote because this is a virtual meeting. And so we'll start with the Mayor Pro Tem. Ms. Ajmira? Mr. Bakari? Aye. I, I, I joined him. Okay. Sorry. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Um, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Is there anyone that objects to the deferral of these items? Hearing no objections, that motion passes unanimously. Madam Mayor? Yes. For the, I don't know if we can get a, a ruling on if this would be allowable, but for the expediency of tonight's meeting with five council members present, could we get five yes votes from hand raises here and then you just find one more on the WebEx? Yes, I could do that. Is that allowable? Yes. It's, that is allowable if everyone agrees <clears throat> and participate in that. I might move us along a little quicker. It is. It, it, will, it will save us a significant amount of time. So um, I also wanted to note for the council's behalf, item nine is something that we will have to vote on to not send back to the zoning committee because of the changes that have been made. So with that, um, we also know that council 
Um, I generally, I do not vote on these items unless there is a um, tie, and I doubt seriously if we'll have any of that tonight. So uh, the final thing before we begin our actual meeting, and I thought about this as Mr. Driggs reminded me and as Mr. Newton spoke um, for the invocation, the loss of our, um, one of our Supreme Court justices, um, Ruth Ginner Brett, I can't even say her name. Brett, thank you, Ed. Um, if you notice the flags flying at half mass, it's because of her service. I think she was appointed by President Clinton, but what she's known for is her advocacy for women's rights, her leadership in um, making sure that women as they said, um, I think a commentator said, that she found ways to protect women by representing men. And in that case, she's done so very much, and she's been through a lot. Many of us have watched her as she's battled cancer and pancreatic cancer, which is a very difficult cancer for anyone. But if we could just acknowledge on behalf of the citizens of our city, our residents, that we've lost someone that has served this country well, I would certainly appreciate if we could just have a moment of silence in her honor. Thank you very much. So we will now begin the um, formal part of our meeting with our first petition is item, our first decision is item number five. Is that correct? All right, here we are. Um, do, um, I wanted to just, this is rezoning petition 2019-111 by high fitness for approximately four acres in district three. The current zoning is general industrial and the recommended, uh, the proposed zoning is transit transition. Um, the staff and the zoning committee recommend approval of this petition. Do I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve this petition? So moved. Second. We have a Ms. Watlington and Mr. Driggs. Um, Mr. Graham. Yes. Are we going to do it in the room by a show of hands? Oh, I'm sorry. Was he speaking? I thought you were taking the vote. I was taking the vote. Well, <laughs> we're going to show hands in the room. Can we just show hands in the room? Uh, you st we still need to do roll call. I think we still have oh, to oh, use that. We we no, I think you have to still do the roll call, but I only have to call on two people. Okay. All right, okay. so yeah. we have Ms. Watlington, Mr. Driggs, Mr. Graham, Mr. Eggleston, Mr. Newton. Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson? Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. All right. Is there anyone that objects to the um, passage of this petition? Hearing no objection, the petition passes unanimously. Item number six, petition 2019-168 by Suncrest Real Estate and Land for approximately 22 acres located outside of the city limits. The current zoning was single family residential in the protected Lake Wiley area. Proposed, the rec proposed zoning is mixed use conditional again in the Lake Wiley protected area. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Do I have a motion for to accept the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve the petition? So moved. Second. We have a motion, Mr. Graham, Mr. Driggs, Ms. Watlington. Yes. Okay, do we have to? I think it might be easier if you just still call the names of the folks in the room and then ask for one more on the on Ms. I, Okay. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Mr. Um, Bakari. Yes. And Mr. Winston. Yes. Is there anyone that objects to this petition? Hearing no objection, the petition passes unanimously. Um, item seven was deferred. The next item is item number eight, petition 2019-184 by the Taft Mills Group for approximately four acres. Um, it's in District 2. It was single-family residential. It's being proposed as multifamily residential conditional. The Zoning Committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Mr. Graham and Mr. Driggs. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. 
Mr. Newton? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? You're done. Yes. I got six with Newton. Oh, there's six there's with just one. Here. You only need Thank one. Thank you. You're right. Thank yep. you. I cannot count today. That's all right. You're doing just, fine. I know most days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, with, is there anyone that objects to this petition? Hearing no objection, this petition passes unanimously. The next item is item number nine. Do I have a motion on whether or not the changes are um, sufficient, not, not or insufficient, to send this item back to the um, zoning committee for motion review? Motion to not send back to zoning committee. Second. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. This requires a three-quarters vote of the council. So I'm going to go in the order by which, so that we can make sure yeah. that we. Have and I, if uh, we yeah, I'd like to Mr. read the Patton changes. Read oh, I'm sorry. No, Please read the fine. changes. Yeah. Uh, so the changes to this petition after the zoning committee recommendation, uh, they act, they modified one of the affordable units from 80% to 50% AMI, so they actually reduced uh, that percentage down to 50. Uh, they placed regulations on short-term rentals at the site. They also added language that uh, committed to a vehicular cross-access connection with the adjacent property that was approved as part of petition 2019-156. And they also added a note to include covered stoops as part of the townhome design along Allen Street. So all uh, items that uh, we believe are minor and do not warrant any additional review by the Zoning Committee. Mr. Eggleston. These, these were also directly in response to concerns that some of the immediately adjacent neighbors had, and so they were done to address some of those concerns. And so they are definitely beneficial to the project and to the neighbor's comfort with the project. Okay, so we're going to um, m m have vote on the changes are insufficient <coughs> to require referral back to the Zoning Committee. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Ms. B Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. All right. So all of those um, present, it is unanimous. All right. So the rezoning petition is 2020 by 005 by Ron Staley for approximately an acre located on Allen and Parkwood in District 1. The current zoning is residential. The proposed zoning is neighborhood services recommended by both the zoning committee and the staff. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. We have a motion to approve and adopt, um, and it was made by Mr. Eggleston and Mr. Driggs. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yeah. Yes. All right. Is there anyone that objects to the um, item? If not, then it uh, passes unanimously. The next item is agenda number 10, item 10, petition 2020-007 by Irwin Capital for approximately 13.2 acres outside of the city limits near Albemarle Road from neighborhood um, business conditional zoning to neighborhood business conditional site plan amendment. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement and approve the petition? So moved. Second. Mr. Newton and Mr. Driggs have mo made the motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Yes. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? I'm sorry. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Thank you. That is a total of six. And is there anyone that objects to this petition? <clears throat> Hearing no objection, it passes unanimously. Agenda item number 11, petition 2020-017 by Aspen Height Partners, approximately 2.7 acres located on east of Baltimore Avenue. It's in District 3. The current zoning is multifamily residential. The proposed zoning is mixed-use development conditional. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval. Do I have a motion to accept the zoning committee statement of consistency as our own and approve the petition? So moved. <laughs> Second. second. We have Ms. Watlington and Mr. Newton. Motion and second. Um, Mr. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Thank you. Is there anyone that objects to this petition? 
Hearing no objection, the pe petition passes unanimously. Next item is number 12, petition 2020-19 by Dependable Development for approximately 18 acres located along the Plaza Road Extension. It's in District 5. The current zoning is residential. The proposed zoning is multifamily residential conditional. The Zoning Committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve and adopt the Zoning Committee statement of consistency as our own? Yes, ma'am. So moved. Mr. Newton. Second. And Mr. Driggs. Mr. Newton made the motion. Mr. Driggs second. Um, is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. All right. Is there anyone in opposition to the petition? Hearing no opposition, the petition passes unanimously. Item 13, petition 2020-021 by K. Sade or Sade um, Ventures for approximately four and a half acres located on the northern side of University City Boulevard outside the city limits. The current zoning is neighborhood business. The proposed zoning is general business conditional. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve this petition? Motion to adopt. All second. right, Ms. Johnson made the motion. Did I hear a second? Yes, yeah, second. Mr. Yeah. Newton, Mayor Pro Tem. All right. So um, we'll start, Mr. Egg Is there any discussion? There are no discussion. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. All right. Is there anyone that opposes this petition? Hearing no one in opposition, the petition passes unanimously. Item 14, petition 2020-022 by Boulevard Real Estate Advisors for approximately 4.2 acres in District 1. The current zoning is heavy industrial. The proposed zoning is transit-oriented development transitional. The Zoning Committee and staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee statement of consistency and approve this petition? Motion to adopt and approve. Second. second. We have a motion and a second by Mr. Driggs. Is there any discussion? There no discussion. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Anyone ob in objection? Anyone objecting to the pr approval of this petition? If not, there it passes unanimously. The next item is item 15, petition 2020-034 by Jefferson Apartment Group for approximately five acres located <laughs> um, in District 1. The current zoning is heavy industrial. The proposed zoning is mixed-use development conditional. The Zoning Committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee statement of consistency and approve the petition? Motion to adopt and approve. Mr. Eggleston. Second. And Mr. Driggs does a second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm just going to continue to encourage the petitioner here, and I know they have been. I know they've discussed as recently as the last day or two um, some of the plans for this project with Liz Clayson Kelly, who is the executive director of Roof Above, formerly Urban Ministry Center and the Men's Shelter of Charlotte. Uh, this project is adjacent to the light rail and uh, adjacent to the Men's Shelter's property. And I know there's a connection that they want to make across the men's shelter property as well as U Hall's property to get to 16th Street from this project for pedestrian connectivity. Um, and I know it, we didn't get it all ironed out before this vote tonight, um, but there is an easement they need from roof above. And I hope that um, they'll continue to work with them both to make that pedestrian connectivity um, and improve the walkability from this site to things like our light rail station, Optimus Hall. Uh, but also how they can be a good neighbor to the men's shelter of Charlotte and to Roof Above and work with them to advance um, the work that they're doing in our community to try to house uh, folks who are housing insecure. And I think that they they want to be a good neighbor and they want to be a partner in that work uh, with Roof Above, but I, uh, I hope they will follow through with the initial conversations they've had with Liz. And... Um, but I know that they, they addressed the concerns staff had previously with uh, the pedestrian experience around that corridor, and, uh, and I think we can move forward with it tonight. All right. Is there any other comment on this petition? 
Hearing no further comment, um, and the motion, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. All right. The next item is item 16, um, petition. You, yeah, ask for anybody opposed. Oh, I'm sorry. Did anyone, uh, does, is there anyone that opposes item number 15? If not, we, it'll be a vote for, un, it'll be unanimously approved. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. The next item is agenda item number 16. Um, petition 2020-039 by Henshaw Properties for approximately four tenths of an acre um, located north of Firefighter Place on East 7th Street. The current zoning is multifamily residential. The proposed zoning is urban residential conditional. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve this petition? Motion to adopt and approve. Second. All right. Mr. Eggleston and Mr. Graham made the motion and it was seconded by Mr. Graham. So is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion. Um, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. All right. Are there any, is there anyone opposed to this petition? Hearing no one in opposition, the petition passes unanimously. Agenda item number 17, petition 2020-046 by Take 5 Carolinas. Wasn't that a ban? Take five, take six, something like that. It was a Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck, yeah. Yeah, that's so cute. I need your help. Thank you, Ed. Ed is our resident musician historian. Okay. All right. Um, this is for approximately an acre located southwest of Whitehall Park Drive in District 3. The current zoning is light industrial conditional. The proposed zoning is light industrial conditional with the site plan amendment. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve this petition? So moved. Second. Ms. Watlington made the motion. Mr. Newton made the second. Um, so any discussion? All right, hearing no discussion, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Is there anyone in opposition to this petition? Hearing no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Item 18, petition 2020-047 by Pecan Ridge of Charlotte. Um, for approximately 1.7 acres on the eastern side of W.T. Harris Boulevard. It's in District 2. The current zoning is a commercial center. The proposed zoning is commercial center site plan amendment. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency as our own and approve this petition? So move. Mr. Graham. Second. Mr. Driggs, second the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Is there anyone in opposition to this petition? Hearing no one in opposition, the motion passes unanimously. The next item is item 19, petition 2020-048 by Flournoy Development Group for approximately 24 acres located on the eastern side of John Adams. It's in District 4. Um, the current zoning is neighborhood business conditional as well as office district conditional. And the proposed zoning is mixed use development optional. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion for to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve the petition? Motion to approve. Ms. Johnson, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Driggs has a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. All right. Is there anyone opposed to this petition? It's approval. Hearing no one in opposition, the petition is approved unanimously. Item number 20, 
2020-051 by M.I. Homes of Charlotte for approximately 21 acres located uh -huh. north of Interstate 485 in District 4. Um, the current zoning is single family residential. The proposed zoning is multifamily conditional. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve this petition and adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency as our own? Motion to approve. Second. With Ms. Johnson made the motion. Mr. Driggs, second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Anyone opposed to this petition? Hearing no one in opposition, the petition passes unanimously. Item 21. 2020-053 by Laurel Oak Farm for approximately 1.3 acres on the south side of Young Blood, outside Young Blood Road, outside of the city limits. The current zoning is single family residential and mixed use development. The proposed zoning is mixed use development optional and mixed use development optional with a site plan amendment. The staff and the zoning committee recommend approval of this. Is there a motion to Accept the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve this petition. So moved. Second. Ms. Watlington moved, made the motion. Mr. Driggs second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. All right. Is there anyone in opposition to this petition? Hearing no one in opposition, the petition passes unanimously. Item 22, petition 2020-054 by TriPoint Homes for approximately 13 acres located on the east side of I-77. It's in District 3. The current zoning is single family residential. The proposed zoning is urban residential consistent conditional. The Zoning Committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee statement of consistency and approve the petition? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Watlington and followed up by Mr. Driggs. Um, is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. All right. So is there anyone that objects to this petition? Hearing no objection, the motion passes unanimously. Item 23, I'm going to ask the Mayor Pro Tem if she would preside. I serve on the board of Novant Health. Sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I, I just, I wrote it down and I just didn't mention it. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. My reading glasses. Um, rezoning petition 2020-058 by Novant Health, approximately 38 acres located at the southeast intersection of Johnson Road and Providence Road West in Council District 7, Mr. Driggs District. Current zoning is institutional, conditional, but proposed zoning is institutional, conditional site plan amendment. The zoning committee has voted 7 to 0 to recommend approval of this petition and the staff recommends approval of this petition. Can I have a motion to approve? Mayor Pro Tem, it's uh, Council Member Driggs. I'd like to thank Novant Health for their investment in South Charlotte and move to approve and adopt. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor are, oh gosh, this will be gotta a do a roll call, Julie. Just get to six. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Uh, Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Uh, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Newton? Mr. Newton? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Vicari? Yes. That's six. <laughs> and I'll make it seven. That, um, is it approved? Are there any in opposition? Okay, hearing none, this, this uh, decision passes. Thank you. I apologize. It was in my notes. I just didn't put the sticky in the right place.
All right, the next petition is item number 24, petition 2020-061 by White Point Partners for approximately two and a half acres located along Brevard Street. It's in District 1. The current zoning is transit-oriented development, optional, and heavy industrial. Um, the proposed zoning is transit-oriented development, urban center. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to approve this and adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency? Motion to adopt and approve. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Eggleston, a second by Mr. Driggs. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Is there anyone that opposes this petition? Hearing no one in opposition, the petition passes unanimously. Item 25, Petition 2020-063 by Kappa Foundation of Charlotte. I think that Mr. Um, Graham should now do a step show for us <laughs> as a part of the um, approval process. Um, the knees, the knees. <laughs> uh, that would be ugly. But, but it would be so much fun, Mr. Graham, so yeah, much fun. Yeah. Um, so this is for approximately 3.4 acres located on the west side of Beatty's Ford Road. It's in District 2. The current zoning is a multifamily residential conditional and single family residential for nine and four units per acre. The proposed zoning is institutional. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and to approve this petition? Fine, Newt. <laughs> that would be uh, yes. Mr. Grimm? <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. I, you know, uh, my son-in-law is a Kappa. Should I call him? And, uh, do you need a lifeline or something I think, like I think, that? I think we're good. I think okay. we're good. All right. So can you, we have a can motion. Can you second that if you're not a Kappa? Yes, you can. <laughs> so um, the motion is by Mr. Graham. I believe the second was by Mr. Eggleston. Is there any discussion that we haven't already had? Um, considering um, that, um, we will have Mr. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Johnson? All right. Um, Mr. Bakari? Yes. All right. Is there anyone in opposition to this petition? Hearing no opposition, it passes unanimously. Agenda item number 26, petition 2020-065 by Herman E. Ratchford for approximately 15 acres located on the south side of Albemarle Road in District 5. The current zoning is office and the proposed zoning is multifamily residential. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve the petition? So moved. Mr. Newton, the Mays motion. Mr. Driggs, second the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Lar Eggleston? Mr. Yes. Mr. Larkin, I'm sorry. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. All right. Is there anyone um, who would object to this petition? Hearing no one in objection, it passes unanimously. Item 27. Petition 2020-070 by the Elmington Capital Group for approximately 5.8 acres located on the south side of Bullard Street it's in District 3. The current zoning is urban residential conditional. The proposed zoning is urban residential conditional with a site plan amendment. The zoning committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency and approve the petition? So moved. Second. second. Ms. Watlington made the motion. Mr. Driggs second the motion. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bakari? Yes. All right. Is there anyone that objects to this petition? Hearing no objection, it passes unanimously. Um, agenda item 28, rezoning petition 2020-092 by Quesade Ventures for approximately 93 acres located on the north side of the University City Boulevard outside the city limits. The current zoning is mixed residential 1 and the proposed zoning is mixed residential 2. 
the Zoning Committee and the staff recommend approval of this petition. Is there a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee statement of consistency and approve the petition? So moved. Second. All right, Mr. Ms. Johnson made the motion. It was um, second by Mr. Graham. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Newton? Mr. Mr. Newton. Uh, no, he, I didn't, <laughs> Julie started that. Mr. Newton? Uh, yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. All right. Is there anyone opposing this petition? Hearing no one in opposition, the petition is approved unanimously. I believe that covers all of our decisions at this point <clears throat> in the agenda process. So it is now time for us to move in the process for our hearings. And just as a reminder, hearings are first included by, um, or first presented by the um, staff, and they get no time limit, but I think they're very sensitive to time limits. Um, and then the petitioner gets three minutes unless their opponents sign up to speak. If the staff or their people or our petitioners are signed up to speak against the petition. This, there are 10 minutes for the petitioner. The opponents get 10 minutes and the petitioner gets a two minute time for rebuttal. Um, and we have a number of petitions tonight that have, I think one, two, three, four, five. We have six petitions um, with opposition tonight, and I believe the very first one is item, wait a minute, am I off, is it 31? The 30. Item 30. Uh, item 30, which is not opposed by anyone, and I don't believe we have anyone signed up to speak on item 30. Item 30 is a petition 2020-104 by the Charlotte Planning Design and Development um, Department. Um, uh, the summary of the petition is about signs, and I'll now turn it over to Mr. Patine to explain what the text amendment proposes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this petition will be presented by Kevin May in our zoning department. Uh, this is a text amendment for signs, and I will turn it over to Kevin to take us from there. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, as Dave said, I am Kevin May, and I represent the petitioner, City of Charlotte Planning, Design, and Development. This is petition 2020-104, which is a proposed text amendment to update the city's sign regulations. Now, as some of you may recall, while the city works through its 2040 comprehensive plan and unified development ordinance projects, Staff brought forward to council some impactful text changes to the TOD zoning districts, the tree ordinance, and the sign regulations in advance of the completion of the comp plan and UDL. Uh, previously, a comprehensive text amendment to the city's sign regulations was approved and adopted by council in October 2019. As part of bringing those advanced pieces forward, staff also committed to evaluating them and improving upon them as we learned from the experience of excuse me, implementing them. And staff did precisely this earlier in May with an amendment to the new TOD zoning districts. And so that provides for you a little bit of context for tonight's public hearing on this petition to amend the city's new sign regulations. Uh, as you can see, uh, what this text amendment proposes is to update the sign regulations previously approved and adopted in October last year. It is proposing to provide additional flexibility and encourage more innovative design. Also, we seek to provide better scale for certain sign types and also allow for greater utilization of building wall space for sign area. And finally, it addresses unintended consequences, clarifies the enforcement process, and also updates, adds, and deletes definitions and graphics. Next slide. So specifically, some of the uh, substantive proposed amendments uh, to the text that we are putting forth is an increased allowance for A-frame signs. We've seen that this has been uh, warmly received and utilized throughout the city. And so we're proposing to allow A-frame signs for all commercial, institutional, multifamily, and temporary outdoor sales uses in all zoning districts uh, to free up some additional building wall space for signage. We're seeking to uncouple awning and canopy signs and regulate them separately as their own sign type. Uh, with regard to marquee signs, we are wanting to encourage more creative design and in introducing a vertically oriented extension from um, the marquee base. 
And with regard to wall-mounted signs, again, encouraging a little bit more creativity and allowing some flexibility with allowing some projections above the tops of walls for certain types of wall-mounted signs. Next slide. Additionally, with skyline signs, uh, we have a situation now where uh, it's not quite scaled uh, to, the, to the best utilization of these type of signs. Um, so what we are proposing is that going forward, skyline sign area is based on building height. And you can see the breakdown in the table there based on building height, the square footage that would be allowed for sign area. And then for detached pole signs, we are increasing the uh, sign area 100% from 42 to 84 square feet with the sign height remaining at a 30 foot maximum. And then lastly, a, a series of technical corrections, specifically with regard to applicability and sign permitting, um, exempting some certain types of logos that may be on equipment and additionally adding on some historic district commission language clarifying and correcting errors, as you can imagine, Scrivener's errors, grammar, punctuation, introducing and revising definitions, specifically revising the definition for on-premise advertising and portable sign structure, and introducing a new definition for sign face, clarifying enforcement, specifically with regard to notices of violation and warning citations, and then lastly, just providing some additional clarification with regard to measurement of sign faces. So lastly, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We find it to be consistent with the center's corridors and wedges growth framework goal to support a diverse and growing economy. And again, the rationale for this is to provide, uh, it provides for additional flexibility and encourages more innovative design, provides greater utilization of building wall space for signage, clarifies the enforcement process, it adds further clarity with its amendments to graphics and definitions, it provides better scale for certain sign types and addresses unintended consequences of the text amendment that was approved and adopted in October 2019. That concludes petitioner's presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. I think some of this discussion started with a frantic phone call I made to Mr. Gioba a year or maybe two ago when a local business in my district had been ordered to paint over a mural that they had that was a beloved mural in the neighborhood. Um, and so I, th I think that the original discussion around this was how do we encourage more creativity, how do we encourage more private investment in public art in our community, but I think now, given what so many of our small businesses are going through in the city and all over the country right now, I'm glad and appreciative that staff continues to improve these policies because I think not only will it encourage more public art in the community, which I think there is broad support for, but I think it will also give more flexibility to our businesses as they start to come back online and try to recover um, from what's been obviously an incredibly difficult year in how they market and how they uh, get their message out to potential customers. So I think there's even more good reasons that we continue to support these sorts of modifications to our regulations now than there were before. Um, and I'm grateful for staff for continuing to, to strengthen um, our position on, on being flexible and trying to be business friendly, art friendly, and um, and kind of forward looking on this issue. Thank you. All right. Um, Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson, did you want to be recognized? I didn't have a question. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought I heard you say that you. Is there any further discussion regarding this text amendment? I, I just have a quick question. There. All right. What is an A-frame sign? What was the first category A-frame sign? Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for that question. That um, uh, it refers kind of to the uh, profile look, but you may know them as sandwich board signs. You often find them in front of businesses or on sidewalks. Are they the ones that basically you take in at the end of the night? Yes. 
Yes. Yes, that's correct. And sometimes they may they may be have menus on them, or they might be say like chalkboards where a business might you know throw on there what their current daily special is. Okay. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else that has any questions or comments? All right, if not, may I have a motion to close the public? We have a second. second. Mr. Eggleston made the motion. Mr. Driggs second the motion. All in favor of this motion? Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. And Ms. Ajmira, I'm sorry, I did not know that you were on the call. If you'd like to um, introduce yourself to, the, um, listen, to our viewers and listeners. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I was having a difficulty joining earlier, um, but I've been on uh, on the meeting for a while. But thank you. All right, Ms. Ajmira serves as an at-large member of the council, and I, I do. You, would you vote in favor of the motion to close the public hearing? Yes. All right. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, is there anyone in opposition to the closing of the public hearing? Hearing no one in opposition, the motion passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is item number 31. It is a rezoning petition 2020-049 by the Keefe Corporation for approximately 156 acres located on the south side of I Interstate 85 outside of the city limits. Um, it's on east of Morris Chapel and north of Wilkinson Boulevard. The current zoning is single family residential three units per acre, Lake Wiley protected area, Lake Wiley critical area. The proposed zoning is general industrial conditional I-2, Lake Wiley protected area and Lake Wiley critical area. And if all of these, um, all of these names and titles or, or, or terms that we use, you can find in, um, in a glossary on our website to look at this if you want to go into more detail of what they all mean. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues. And so we'll have um, Dave give us a presentation. Um, in this case, we have four speakers um, to speak in favor of the petition. The petitioners have organized and have produced a video that they would like to have shown for the petition. So we will have um, Mr. Horwich, Mr. McVeigh, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Goddard, and Mr. Buley um, speak in favor. And then there will be um, time for the petitioners to show a video. And I believe, if this is correct, Mr. Sm Sam Smith is going to be also speaking on behalf of those in opposition. So with that, we'll go ahead and proceed, and I'll try to keep up. Mr. Patin. Thank you. Uh, Petition 2020-049 uh, is just over 156 acres. It is located, as we said, south of I-85 uh, along Morse Chapel Road, uh, just north of Wilkinson Boulevard. Uh, the current zoning, as mentioned, is R3. There are Lake Wiley protective overlay as well as uh, critical area overlay on the property. Uh, the proposed zoning this evening for this petition is I-2 conditional. Uh, those Lake Wiley overlays for the protective area and the critical area will also remain intact uh, should the zoning be approved. The adopted future land use for this project uh, is for single family, and that's from the Dixie Berry Hill Strategic Plan that was adopted in 2003. Uh, the proposal itself this evening is for up to 1.53 million square feet of industrial uses, outdoor storage uh, developed with potentially up to three buildings. Uh, you have one single building over one phase is another possibility, uh, but again, that total would not be able to exceed 1.53 million square feet. Uh, there is a 100-foot Class A buffer against any residential uses. Uh, a traffic impact study would be submitted during the subdivision review process. Uh, there are some transportation improvements associated with this petition. Uh, one of those is uh, a realignment of Morse Chapel Road, uh, which would tie back into Wilkinson Boulevard, as well as an extension of Lake Brook Road as a public street uh, once those development conditions would trigger that improvement. Uh, there are also intersections improvements at Lake Brook Road and Sam Wilson Road, as well as turn lane, uh, turn lanes from Morris Chapel Road into the site. Uh, also, an eight-foot planning strip and 12-foot multi-use path would be installed along the entire uh, frontage for the site along Morris Chapel Road. And there's also commitments to continue to work with our uh, land use and environmental permitting folks uh, to enhance uh, erosion control measures uh, that would be associated with the development. 
Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. Uh, it is inconsistent with the Dixie Berry Hill strategic plan. Uh, however, staff feels that there's uh, transportation improvements would mitigate uh, traffic impacts that would uh, be a part of this project. Uh, they will have provided buffers between the industrial development and adjacent residential neighborhoods. Uh, there are uh, existing and numerous residential, or excuse me, industrial projects that have been developed in the area recently, especially along the Wilkinson Boulevard corridor, as well as along Interstate 45 and Sam Wilson Road. Uh, the location of this site near I-85 and Wilkinson Boulevard, as well as the Charlotte Douglas International Airport, does provide regional access, which makes this site and this area uh, generally desirable for a larger scale industrial development. Uh, and the site is located within a growth corridor as per the center's corridors and wedges growth framework, which does encourage industrial development near interchanges like this. So uh, again, that's uh, staff's recommendation. We do have uh, presentations by both petitioners and members of the community. Uh, staff will be happy to answer any questions following those presentations. All right. Um, Mr. McVeigh, are you going to organize the speakers in favor? Mr. Horwitz? Yes, Mayor, I, okay. I am. I okay. believe uh, Mr. Joel Horwick, Horwick was going to go first and use uh, two minutes of time and then turn over the presentation to us uh, as well. But if, if he's not ready, I'm happy to go first. So one, um, Mr. Horwich. Why don't we let me, why don't you let me start, Mary? Uh, yeah, and then I'll, I'll I, I, I hear, I think I hear two people uh, speaking yeah. at one time. Yes, I'm prepared to, uh, to speak if it is convenient. Or All right, Mr. Horwich, you, the whole group has 10 minutes, so that's, I just want to make sure everybody understands that time is called at 10, no matter if you say two, but if it ends up being five, it's five left for everybody else. So it's just the way the rules work. Okay, and Mr. Horwich. Very well. Uh, Ms. Lyles, Ms. Bing, the Honorable Members of the Zoning Commission and the City Council. My name is Joel Horwich. I'm speaking uh, in favor of the conditional rezoning proposal 2020-049. I reside in West Charlotte on Moore's Chapel Road and have been a resident here since the year uh, 2008. I argue it primarily in favor, of, but for those who cannot be present today, they include our trees and what is vastly, vastly more important, the generations of Charlottians who will rely upon those trees and your decisions here today and in the weeks and months that follow. A few facts. As you may know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has determined that one acre of forest absorbs approximately six tons of carbon dioxide while emitting uh, four tons of oxygen annually. In fact, trees absorb and remove pollutants such as carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide. They conserve water and soil. Trees lower air temperature, they absorb and filter solar energy as well. An inconvenient truth here is between 2012 and 2018, isn't it? Residential expansion. Mr. Mr. Horwich, I, I want to make sure if, if you'll just stop us um, from the, Madam Clerk. We, it's very choppy, and we can barely hear what you're saying or understand you. And I want to make sure that you, that you feel that you have it heard. If you have this in a written format, would you please make sure that we get a copy of that and the clerk can distribute it to the full council? But right now, it's just very difficult to understand. Yes, ma'am. Should I continue or distribute I it? I think if you speak the, as you are now, that would um, be more clear, but I would still suggest sending in your written remarks to the city clerk. You can email them to the city clerk's office. I will take care of that and finish up very shortly. Yeah, I continue for now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, between years 2012 and 2018, business and residential expansion caused the destruction of approximately 8% of the city's pre canopy that translated to approximately 250,000 trees. As you are probably aware, North Carolina Code of Ordinances, Section 21, permits up to 90% destruction of trees in residential and single family areas, that is Section 2195, and 85% in commercial zones, that's Section 2194. Uh, that state statute dates back all the way to 1978. Nothing about our present growth would seem to militate against Charlotte becoming another Atlanta 
or some other city of that nature. In fact, Atlanta has 3% more tree coverage. Um, with regard to the addendum that I've submitted, and I will resubmit to the clerk, please note that I have pictures of my home as it stands now, pictures of the uh, five acres that have recently been clear cut on a plane directly above my home um, that have caused pictures of the soil erosion and flooding that we have there, but is consistent with any other removal of trees without proper zoning or consideration. And also other pictures, uh, November through Oscar and through all clear cutting uh, amid the Mr. Hubble, if you could restrictions. Yes, I'm coming now. And just to note, if you do not or you disapprove the petitioner's request, we could have 468 of the homes I've pictured there come in. That, that would uh, lead to, uh, what you see, ornamental trees on site. But if you approve uh, what they're requesting, we could also wind up with tree construction. In conclusion, I humbly move that this commission accept the petitioner's condition, conditional rezoning and request that um, they adhere to strict restriction of no more than 55 to 60 percent tree canopy destru destruction of the entire project to be surrounded by. Thank you. Sorry if I took too long. Thank you. Madam Clerk, how many minutes does the? Six minutes, 38 seconds. You have six and a half minutes, Mr. McVeigh. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, member of the zoning committee. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank the staff for their support and assistance with this petition. As Dave has mentioned, this site is located near the airport, near I-85 and Wilkinson Boulevard in a growth corridor, which is an appropriate location for this type of use. Uh, a little bit about the Keith Corp, funded in, uh, fund started in 1990, in 1989 by Graham Keith Sr. and Jr. have developed over 310 developments in 34 states and five countries, has become one of the most well-respected and full-service private commercial firms in the nation. I'm going to turn it over to Alan Lewis, the real estate, the managing partner for industrial development in the, for Keith Corp. Go ahead, Alan. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alan Lewis. I'm the managing partner of our industrial development uh, division. Um, what On this slide, I'd really like to just point out the 48 acres on the east side, entire east side of the property that is not being rezoned. Uh, it will, will remain R3. Um, that um, it, um, So it completely separates the project site from any adjacent um, residential that is along Sam Wilson Road. Next slide, please. Um, this slide actually shows um, the Class A buffers that will be put in uh, on each side of what is shown as the single building plan. They are 100 feet on each side. Um, and of course, that does not include the additional 48 acres east of the eastern boundary. Um, access to the site, uh, if you would actually go to the next slide, please. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, go back one. Oh, this one, yes. So this slide really shows the, uh, the buffer areas, the tree save areas. Uh, we will have um, approximately 30% on this plan is shown as tree save, uh, but we will be planting additional trees along the entrance roads into the site. Uh, as well as around the boundary of the truck courts and parking areas. So, uh, and that 30% does not include the area of the 48 acres that is not being rezoned. Also, you can see on this plan at the top, uh, the connection of Lake Brook Road into the um, I-85 and Sam Wilson Road interchange. We will be creating a left turn lane uh, coming out. Um, there's already a, a right turn lane uh, or middle lane being put in there from another project. Uh, we've been asked by our TIA uh, review to put in some interchange improvements, which we are willing to do. Um, and um, most of the truck traffic that will be coming to this project will be exiting off of 85 onto uh, Sam Wilson Road and turning uh, into the northern end of the site to get into the uh, truck court area. Uh, the other way trucks would come in would be off of Wilkinson Boulevard and up the uh, realigned uh, Moore Chapel Road uh, section that we are building, uh, so coming in from the south. 
I would not anticipate much truck traffic coming south on Morris Chapel Road, excuse me, from above I-85, nor would I envision truck traffic coming north on Sam Wilson from Wilkinson. All of those areas could, of course, be used for automobile traffic. We expect to invest about $5.5 million in public infrastructure, including the road improvements, a sewer lift station that would serve a broader community. And so all of the off-sites will be done at our expense. There will not be any public expenditure on those. Next slide, please. Next slide. Keith, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Alan. Just quickly regarding transportation and generation, trip generation, as Alan has mentioned, the site could be developed with over 400 or about 468 single-family homes. The proposed development actually represents an 1,800 trip reduction, daily trip reduction in cars or vehicles from the site, a reduction of 128 in the a.m. peak and a reduction of 236 trips in the evening peak. That compounded with the substantial and meaningful improvements that Alan just described, we see that as a huge benefit to the area and the location for this site. Next slide. This is an image of the realigned portion of Morris Chapel Road that will be constructed as part of the site. This will be a two-lane facility with 75 feet of right-of-way, two 12-foot lanes, two 12-foot multi-use paths, as well as eight-foot planning strips. Next slide, please. Alan, I think you were going to speak to this one. Yes, I just, this slide in particular, I believe, shows why this type of development ought to be in a location like this with the interchange of I-85 and I-485, as well as Wilkinson Boulevard with I-485 and the multitude of ways that you can come in and out. Again, the truck traffic would be coming off of Sam Wilson, Lakebrook, and north from Wilkinson to our project site on the new road that we will be building. We have conducted our traffic study and are reviewing that now, but are basically in alignment of all the recommendations in the draft. So we are going to comply with those and pay for those improvements privately. Next slide, please. In terms of zoning benefits, some of the benefits we see with this petition is, again, substantial and meaningful roadway improvements that are being funded by the developer, buffers, a tree-safe area that was mentioned, and enhanced erosion control measures to address water quality issues, economic benefits. I'd also add industrial zoning plans to address the need for that type of system. Mr. McFane, that's the end of the 10 minutes. Now we will get some help from Ms. Jackson to set up for the opposition. And, again, we're starting with the video to be followed, I believe, by Mr. Smith. And you will have 10 minutes. I think we have... Wendy, there's no volume. We've got to start at the beginning. There's no video, right? Is that right? Wendy, can you stop the video and add the volume?
We, we will start the video from the very beginning, and that will be the beginning of the 10 minutes. Um, Just to let you know it's coming in through um, at clear at home. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> we, we don't have that clarity here, Mr. Bakari. Do you know interpretive dance would work, Mr. Bakari? Let the record show that was Councilman Winston, please. Oh, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> Councilmember Winston. All right, we're still working working on it. Madam Mayor, this is Keith. We we couldn't hear the audio either. Yeah, we we're aware. We're working on it. An IT person is coming. What did you say? An IT person is coming. They're going to have to do something with this computer to make the sound play. Yeah. In the meantime, we would welcome an interpretive dance, Mr. Picari, or Mr. <laughs> I'm not sure how I got pulled into all of this. <laughs> it's the new do. It's the new do. <laughs> Um, Mr. Smith, would you like to comment until, until well, I'm not sure it's a, if it's, a it's seven layered, minutes. if it's, you know, like you do one and it stops you from working on the other. Not that I'm an IT person, that's for sure. I can hardly remember how to change an Excel thing. So. Stayed up to see the Lakers game last night. I did. I did too. It's, it's just like watching a machine. <laughs> but you know, you want it to be the back. What's the guy that did the three minute shot at the end? Oh my God. Have a try playing for a few seconds and then stop. Try stopping the file and then reloading. Try to have a, uh, Wendy, try turning off the file and then re-upload it in the WebEx. She said turn, turn it off, turn it off, and then re-upload it. Okay. 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 Yeah, it was crazy, wasn't it? They're all looking at it like they couldn't touch it. Like, no one on your hands can go through. It was just, it was, I was like, the same time, I was like, okay. Hold on, can I, can I try logging out of WebEx and log back in? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to log out. I'm going to log 267 out and then I'm going to log it back in. We, we cannot hear it at home now. I'm going to, I'm going to log out real quick and log back Perhaps in. Perhaps we can watch this uh, unmute, unmute. offline. Okay, so guys, we're going to go away really quickly and come back. We're going to see if, if restarting the, the WebEx will help. So. Um, part of our, all right, whatever we're having now. It's not, it's not going to be that. Mm -mm. No, 
that's what's weird. Yeah, it was working on all the other devices. Yeah. She needs to make us a panelist. She's probably going up. Right. Yeah. We have all of that cheap technology in our TV. We probably spend a few thousand bucks. Okay, make us a panelist. It's getting new TV. So. What? Do I need to get one? Well, that's confusing because that's the light you have in your box. You saw one of these. We can hear it, but it also don't fix. It seems like magic. Yeah. Just a little more time about the night of robotics. Right? Yeah. 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 Ye
Thank you for laughing. Wendy, you. can you unmute okay. Mr. Smith? Okay. <laughs> I think we're going to have to defer it until next week, the 28th, in order to be fair to, we've given the um, proponents 10 minutes. They get a rebuttal. The, the folks in opposition have 10 minutes to present. And right now they had a seven minute video with a, a plan for three additional minutes of comment. And so the question is, then we would have to follow up with questions from the entire council um, if we add it to the 28th um, meeting, or we could just. Madam Mayor, I, I just might add that while definitely extended time and conversations I think are warranted, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty out of the ordinary for us to have a prepared video to watch. In fact, I, I can't remember more than maybe one time where that ever happened. So, may I, I, I think may I speak? Excuse me. This is Missy Epps who helped prepare the video. It was on the advice okay. of yes, China. Of, it was on the advice of one of the council members that I spoke with about this petition. That we prepared the video in order to be able to actually see the voices of the those of us that are protesting the petition. Um, I can, if I can be given ability to share my screen, I could perhaps show the video myself, or we, um, or we could come back and speak on the 28th, and I would be on. I, I, I was wondering if we could share screen under this, um, under our technology. So this is what I propose to do. If, if the council would, we will go through a next series of, we continue the public hearings, and then we would come back um, after we get an okay from our technology team, they're ready to present and work with you. I'm sorry, I did not get your name, ma'am. Missy Epps. Ms. Epps, that you, that you would work with our team members, and when this is ready to go, we would come back to you for that time. They're ready. Oh, they're ready now? Yeah, they're ready to try Okay, it. I just found out magic happens. All right, my understanding is the video is ready now. Well, the share screen is they're ready. Share, they're going to share oh, the, the screen. Oh, the share screen is ready. <laughs> so we're going to go to that immediately now. Is that right? Yes. All right, so um, we're going to go to the share screen with you, Ms. Epps. I have to, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't ready to do this. I just have to find it in my file structure. I apologize. All right, so what if we go ahead and give you time to work with our team and we will come back to it. We will now go to item 32, which is the next public hearing. Come back to item 31 when that is ready and Ms. Jackson will notify me when it's ready. So thanks everyone for their patience. I'm, we're going to go to agenda item 32, a zoning hearing for 20, petition 2020-059 by Hanover RS Limited Partnership for approximately 1.4 acres on the south side of Euclid um, near Moorhead. It's in District 1. The current zoning is neighborhood business optional with a pedestrian overlay and mixed-use development. And the proposed zoning is mixed-use development district optional. And in this case, we do have um, four speakers in favor and no one against. And so we'll have the staff presentation. And Mr. Carmichael, will you be coordinating the three minutes for the petitioners? Mr. Carmichael? Well, maybe we can't talk to anybody while they're fixing the screen, huh? This is well. He should be on. I was, I was just texting. Oh, okay. Thank you. So we will um, here have, have the staff presentation, and then Mr. Carmichael, Mr. Buchanan, Mr. Zaria, and Doolittle. All right, Mr. Patin. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, 2020-059, uh, 1.474 acres. This is on Euclid Avenue, Royal Court, in East Moorhead. Uh, if we take a quick look at the existing zoning, currently we have B1 pedestrian overlay zoning uh, for this property. The proposed zoning, as mentioned, was a MUD optional. Uh, the adopted future land use is from the Midtown Moorhead Cherry Plan. That was in 2012. That recommends a mix of residential office and retail uses for the area in which the site is located. Uh, this particular petition is for a 350-unit multifamily uh, uh, building with accessory uses. This would be one singular building on the site. Uh, 
There are optional provisions, uh, which would be to allow maximum building height of 170 feet. We do have some modifications to the streetscape along Royal Court for on-street parking, as well as on-street passenger pickup and drop-off. Uh, encroachments into setback along Royal Court for some stairs, uh, things like transformers, balconies, roof overhangs, et cetera. Uh, we also have multiple transportation improvements proposed with this petition, which include uh, drop off an entrance only access point uh, and a full access movement onto Euclid Avenue. Uh, uh, John, can you mute your mic, please? Thank you. Uh, proposed eight foot sidewalk and eight foot planting area along East Moorhead, along with existing trees. Those would remain in place. Uh, we'd have a stop sign, stop bar, and crosswalk on Euclid Avenue at the intersection of Euclid and Royal Court. And we also have a stop sign, stop bar, and crosswalk on Royal Court on the southerly leg of the intersection at Royal Court and Euclid. There are also enhanced architectural elements, including transparency requirements along the ground floor. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues to work through that are related to site and building design, as well as some technical revisions related to transportation. Uh, we've been in coordination uh, with the petitioner and feel those will be worked out prior to zoning committee. Uh, it is consistent with the Midtown Moorhead Cherry Plan uh, for a mix of residential office and retail. Uh, and again, we do recommend approval and we'll be happy to take any questions following uh, the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. All right, Mr. Carmichael, you have three minutes. Can you hear me, Madam Mayor? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, I think I have a PowerPoint. I don't know if we can do PowerPoints because we're working on another video screen. We can't. Oh, there we have it. There, go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess next slide, please. Um, my, Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and members of council and zoning committee, I'm John Carmichael, and I represent the petitioner. With me tonight are Bo Buchanan and Kayvon Zaray of the petitioner and Nate Doolittle of Land Design. Uh, the site contains approximately 1.47 acres and is located on the southwest corner of the intersection of East Moorhead Street and Euclid Avenue. It's outlined in red. Uh, the site is currently zoned B1 Pet and Mud O. Next slide. Uh, the next slide. The petitioner is requesting that the site be rezoned to Mudo to accommodate the development of a building on the site. It could contain a maximum of 350 dwelling units and have a maximum height of 170 feet. The petitioner has worked diligently with the Royal Court Condominium Association and the Dilworth Land Use Committee. And we appreciate the time that these folks have provided to us. We also appreciate the work of the planning staff and their favorable uh, recommendation. I will turn it over to Bob Buchanan. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, can we advance a couple of slides? I think we're, we're a couple behind there. Uh, but while we don't have much time, so really what I wanted to communicate is just who I am and, and, and my company, the Hanover Company. Uh, we're a nationwide multifamily development company specialized in very high-end uh, multifamily specifically. Uh, we have been doing business in Charlotte since 1990. Uh, one more slide, please. Um, and, and really nationwide uh, since 1983. Uh, our, and I guess we've done 190 deals, 65,000 uh, homes across the country, 4,500 are in Charlotte, and 15 deals, which represents half a billion investment in Charlotte. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide. Next slide. Uh, next slide. <laughs> okay, this is just a, our geographic footprint that we've uh, uh, generated since 1983. I uh, showed you that uh, uh, heavy eastern seaboard uh, concentration. Uh, we showed you Texas uh, concentration. We're located in Houston, Texas, 575 employees. And the way that we're organized, we're a very centralized group. Uh, we, uh, we call it from soup to nuts here. We, uh, uh, we source our own land, have our own cap get our own capital. Uh, we have our design group that Kayvon's a part of. You're going to hear from him uh, to go and control the process and control the quality of our design. Have our own GC and then have our own operating folks to operate the uh, With that, I was going to hand it over to Nate. I think we had some technical dish, uh, issues with Nate. I think he's still muted. Uh, so if you go to the next next slide, I'll take over the, the site, go over the site plan real quick. Uh, oh, excuse me, I forgot about this slide. Uh, this is just a, a smattering, an example of our products across the country. Upper left is the building I'm in, uh, showing that uh, you're, you're more uh, uh, modern high rise. Uh, uh, you, over to the well, upper Mr. right. Mr. Cannon, that's your the, time is up. Okay. So the three minutes are up. Now, now we open it up for questions from the City Council. Mr. Eggleston? Yeah, I, I wondered if you realized you only had three minutes there because it felt like there were some other parts to this presentation, but. 
Um, I've, I've met with these folks and talked with the folks at um, the Royal Court as well as the Doris Community Association, and I think that we're, everybody's mostly on the same page here at this point. The one thing I would say, uh, I would encourage the petitioner to continue to work with the Doris Community Association. I know there are ongoing discussions with their leadership about um, trees around the site and having larger trees than maybe had been in the original plans. Uh, some of that will probably require coordination with Duke Energy to allow for that to be incorporated into the streetscape. But um, hopefully the petitioner can work through those small uh, items. But I think by and large they have addressed uh, most of the concerns and most of the asks of the neighborhood association as well as the most immediate neighbor to this site. So um, unless there are any additional questions, are there any questions from the council members that are um, logged in? Without any uh, motion to close the hearing. Second. We have a motion second to close the public hearing. Mr. Eggleston, Mr. Driggs. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. All right, is there anyone who objects to closing the public hearing? Hearing no objections, public hearing is now closed. Are we ready to go back to? Thank you. Thank you. Um, are we ready to go back? Yes. Thank you. All right, we, thank you, Mr. Carmichael. Um, we thank are you. now, I'm sorry. Um, we are now ready to go back to petition 2024-049 by the Keith Corporation for a video from those that are in opposition to the development or to the petition. Okay, I think that this is gonna work. Uh, members of the city council, I appreciate your time and patience with this unconventional video, normally to demonstrate the large number of neighbors that are in opposition to a petition like this, we would have showed up to your council chambers wearing red shirts or something like that. And we hope that this video will at least give you a sense of the diversity and numbers of faces and people that are in protest to 2020-049. Still no point on. It's still not working. Can't hear it. Uh, we, we, we're working on it. Um, we'll start, I promise you, we'll start it at the beginning if we can get it to work. If we can't get it to work, then we will move it to the 28th. Yeah, this time it's coming from her computer. I'm, I was sharing my screen, but I understand. No, I'm not sure what's happening. Well, I understand that very much. Okay. Or dial up internet. All right. <laughs> So if it's, we've Can tried it on our computer and she's tried it on her computer. for check pay. <laughs> so she's tried it on her computer and we've tried it on our computer. So the best thing I can say is for us to send the link to the council members. So, um, Ms. Epps, um, yes. I think that we have two choices. Um, you can send this to every council member and you can have seven, um, ten minutes to walk through your presentation. Um, and then follow that with a mailing the video to all the council members, or we can um, go back and put this on our um, September 28th agenda and have it be a separate item. I'm not so sure that we'll be able to figure out how to do this virtually as well as to provide the adequate um, attention to the video that you have. Something's not compatible. and. I, I don't want it to be a situation where we're not giving you the chance to show us that video. So this is my suggestion is to email all the council members, well, email the city clerk or to the planning staff the video. Um, and we would give you um, the 10 minutes now to talk about the issues in the petition or we can reschedule it so that if there is a fix, we would ha you could still email us the video and then you'd have three minutes to um, speak on it at the next meeting. I know that's a difficult choice, but trying to be fair to give the 10 minutes of time to you 
Madam Mayor, if I could suggest, if if we're going to give an alternative here, um, I think understanding, I mean, this is a pretty large project, it seems, understanding the implications of pushing for a month because of the video and not knowing that we can actually make it work in a month. I mean, I think we should either figure out how to do that now or at maximum keep it in this month cycle and add it to our agenda next week. I think it would be a little unfair just because of our own it's technical difficulties and inability to play videos to a project of this magnitude a month. I had said it was for next week. Mr. Bakari, it would be next week. And I've offered oh, two I options. Next. I'm sorry okay. if if I may have, but just in case. No, that, that's fine. Then. Okay. okay, so there are two choices here. Mail the video and have 10 minutes now to explain it and work through it. Or just wait until next week and show the video and have three minutes to explain it. So you get your 10 minutes no matter what, right? <laughs> Am I in, am I appropriate? So I understand. I, I hate to speak on behalf of the dozens of people who um, were part of this. Um, Sam Smith, I believe, is also on the call. He's a neighborhood leader as well. Um, you know, I, I just do want to make sure that the council understands that we submitted the video on Friday and we're told that everything was in working order. So. Um, we do. We absolutely yeah. understand that. This is really regrettable. We actually, I was looking forward to it because we've talked about it for a, a number of times today. So no, this is no, no, no um, intent at all on behalf of um, you or for us. I just want to give you two choices, and as I said, to comply with the, the court, the case law that we have. The opposition has ten minutes, so you can take ten minutes now or you can send us the video and we can watch it and then you have three minutes. So yes, I, I understand. I was going to see if I was could hear from um, some of my colleagues or, or neighbors really, honestly, who were on She's the video still, seeing if they were texting me. Um, uh, I think it looks like we'd like to go ahead and talk tonight. We um, worry that if we wait a week that the uh, notes from the petitioner themselves would be um, lost to you. So I can speak to this petition, and then I'd also like for Sam Smith, who I believe is also on the on the um, call tonight, to, for him to be able to speak some words as well. And also, um, Janaris Washington and a couple of other people are also had been planning to play the video, and are just in, uh, Lisa Gorskowski, I believe, is also on the call. All of them were in the video. And we're here prepared to speak um, if necessary. So um, I guess I'd like to speak now, let Sam go, and then if if there's still time and, the, and those others that are on the call would like to, to give them the opportunity. There, there are at least 15 other people, I understand, from my list. But let me just suggest this. If you take um, four minutes, Mr. Smith takes four minutes, that would give you four a, I'm sorry, that would not give it for him. I'm terrible at math. Two minutes for a wrap up, but we would still get the video. You could email that video to all of us and we'll still watch everyone that's in the video will have the opportunity to be viewed. And the zoning committee should be And the zoning answer. committee will have it as well. Does that, so I just, so. Sure. All right. So <laughs> that's, we'll start with um, Miss, is everyone okay with this? Everybody understand what we're doing? All right, so Ms. Epps um, is going to lead us off in speaking in opposition to the petition. Yeah, and so I don't believe, maybe I can even share my video. I don't, oh, here I am. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't planning on speaking this evening, That's so okay. thank you for listening. Um, obviously, rezoning petition 2020-049 is a massive um, proposal that would be injected into the middle of what is in fact a, quite a residential area. Um, one of the images that the petitioner showed this evening that zoomed out onto a larger area of industrial is somewhat misleading. I would encourage each of you to drive down the roads of Morris Chapel and Sam Wilson and to see that the area that this property, um, that this parcel is in, is in fact very isolated from that existing industrial development. 
You don't feel or hear that development as you drive around our residential neighborhoods. And I believe I don't need to tell this council um, the research, I'm sure you're all familiar with the research that shows unambiguously the links between the proximity of residential neighborhoods to industrial and how those, that proximity correlates with negative health outcomes, with lowering of home prices, with environmental, with negative environmental justice. Um, this particular parcel is in the Lake Wiley area, situated between two streams that drain directly into Lake Wiley, into the Catawba River. So the environmental impacts are, would be amplified by the, proxi by the proximity of this site with Lake Wiley. So there's many reasons that are outlined in the video for why industrial is a bad idea in this particular location. But more importantly, my neighbors and I want to emphasize the potential that is lost in this location if it is, becomes rezoned to industrial. In other words, it's a location that can take advantage of access to the light rail that's gonna be coming within less than half a mile for even the southern part boundary of this parcel would even fall within the Todd, a, a Todd rezoning district, for example. It's close to the Whitewater Center, the Iswa Nature Preserve, the uh, Lake Wiley, all of these things are amenities that are attractive to residents. They're why we moved out here. We know, uh, and we know there's industrial here, but we wouldn't have moved in areas like this where this parcel is if we could feel that industrial. But this rezoning would actually bring a link to industrial uh, in an area that otherwise could be redeveloped for something like uh, housing or amenities. This part of Charlotte ranks in some of the, has some of the lowest equity scores for access to amenities and environmental justice in the whole county. So do we really wanna to add to that by inserting a, a, a facility that's three times the size of the Amazon uh, warehouse to the south on Wilkinson? Um, there's many other things we could touch on, but I think that's uh, it, and I'd be happy to answer questions about it. We'll have, op we'll have time for questions afterwards as well. So now, Mr. Smith, Sam Smith, are you prepared? How many minutes do we have left, Ms. Kelly? 6.31. We have six minutes and 31 seconds. Mr. Smith? Yes, thank you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Lyles, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and our honorary council members. Uh, my name is Sam Smith, Jr. I'm here today um, to speak against the rezoning for Petition 2020-049. I've lived in the Morris Chapel area for over three years. I'm a community leader, president of the Northwest Community Alliance, um, HRA president for uh, Morris Chapel Village, and board member for Freedom Division Advisory Council. Um, if you're not uh, aware of the area, the only thing around us is warehouses and or distribution hubs. Most of the workers that are from the area, including those um, most of the people that, that work at these warehouses are not from the area, including those that work in the warehouses. O over the last several years, I have been reaching out and engaging developers to look at the area because of the potential to develop and bring jobs and other economic mobility and workforce drivers to the area for the residents. Uh, which is why I'm against this rezoning petition today. Um, I'm not sure if in, any of you are familiar with the Morris Chapel Road area. It is a very narrow two-lane road that has plenty of curves. Um, bringing a massive project like this in this area will not only disturb the current residents, but it will create a traffic nightmare and impede on a road that over 200 bikers use weekly. We would like to see a more economic-friendly uh, project proposed for this, um, for this area of Charlotte, perhaps more single-family residential, affordable housing, community park and rec recreational center, bike lanes, restaurants, shopping, et cetera. Um, to show you the distaste, the, the, the distaste for this project, over 125 community members have signed a petition in opposition to this rezoning. Lastly, many of the residents in the area, also not English speakers, have reached out to me inquiring if they could also reach out to council um, via email, specifically written in Spanish. So today I'm asking you to please, please, please do not support this petition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how many? How much time do we have left? 
Um, four minutes and 30 seconds. We have four minutes and 30 seconds. Um, I'm going to just go down the list that I have. Ms. Maddox. Ms. Maddox. Ms. Borowski. Borkowski. Borkowski. Excuse me. I'm very, ba very bad at languages, and I apologize. Um, please, you have, um, would you like to take two minutes of the four remaining minutes? I'll try and take a minute. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, planning staff, and all other guests. My name is Lisa Borkowski, and I live in the Westmoreland community. Um, I have previously submitted a letter con concerning the petition 2020-049. I urge you to consider the impacts that it will have to the far West Charlotte community. In the short term, the benefits, some of the benefits include jobs, and, and some growth, but in the long term, there could be dire consequences to the environment and the community. I currently stand opposed to the industrial rezoning petition 2020-049. Thank you. Thank you very I much. Ms. Um, Callahan. Ms. Callahan. Jody Adams. Larry Doster, Lynn Cook. Ms. Cook was on. Hello. Yes. Hello. Tell me who you are. This is Lynn Cook. All right, Ms. Cook. Um, we have a few minutes left. Three minutes, forty-two seconds. Three minutes. I live in Westmoreland, and that's the neighborhood that this is going to back right up against on the Morris Chapel side. My biggest concern is the noise abatement with our neighbors. We already are hearing the beepers from Amazon um, all during the night. And with loves on the other side of I-85, the truck traffic is unreal. Uh, we asked for a stoplight at that intersection and we're told that was not allowed. So we are we have so many trucks coming in this area, it's unbelievable. And when there's a wreck on I-85, Sam Wilson gets everything. All the traffic comes from Wilkinson Boulevard and from I-85. So my concern is the traffic on Sam Wilson. We also have one entrance and exit into our neighborhood. And whenever there is a wreck out there, we cannot get out of our neighborhood going in either direction. So my concern is the traffic, also the noise abatement, and over half of this property is the lake protected area, and I don't see how that's gonna be protected uh, with this proposal. So uh, that's my uh, reasoning for coming to this, and, and I just hope you'll think about it. And even the developers, if they will think about it, that coming in on Lake Brook, that road is a dirt road right now, a gravel road, and I don't know how they're gonna bring trucks in and out of there safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Janice Collins. Tom Collins. Mark Carter. Mr. Carter was on. Uh, Mr. Carter? He was, he was on. Uh, Collins or Carter? Carter. Mr. Carter, we have a few, a minute or so left. A minute 58. About two minutes left, Mr. Collins. Would you like to speak to the petition? Mr. Carter? Okay. Um, Ms. Washington, Janarius Washington. And Madam Mayor, I don't believe any other um, folks that signed up. Okay. Yeah, can I, I can speak again. This is Missy Epps. I, the reason that they're not uh, available is because we had planned to show the video. I, I, I know, I understand, but I just yeah. want to make sure you have two minutes left. Would you like to give us um, a summary in two minutes? Yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you. H hold on just one second. Ms. Janaris is on. I'm sorry. Yes. Ms. Janaris. 
Thank you, Ms. Washington. Everyone. Two minutes. You, you're going to wrap up the neighborhood sentiments about this, right? Absolutely. So, with everything we've heard, um, I definitely oppose. Let's let's think about the brands of our West Charlotte area. It's an opportunity to work together and to make it a better place. We we are one of the fastest growing cities, and we need to show that we are a place of opportunity and that we could also have residential where people can make their dreams come true when it comes to, to having land and own and having their home, just like I've had that opportunity. I want others to have that same opportunity. So we know that the, the infrastructure for our roads need help, um, and it's going to take time, guys, and I just feel like West Charlotte is not ready yet. Let's think about our water quality, like we've heard. Let's think about our air quality, our trees. We're trying to preserve some of the natural boundaries that we have left. And if we don't do something about it and we continue to just grab the hanging fruit, then instead of doing more effective planning, then what exactly are we expecting for our future generations? Um, so, so with that said, you know, we want to summarize that after you see the video, please let us know if you have any questions, but please keep in mind that we have bikers on our lanes. We have a two lane road and we're not the only ones going into Morse Chapel and other roads. And so we want to make sure that we do the right thing for, for everyone around us. And um, we think about the fact that we need more residential um, areas as well. That concludes my call. Thank you very much. So with that, we will have the petitioner has a two minute rebuttal. Um, and Mr. McVeigh, I don't know if you're going to be representing the petitioner, but I'd just like to ask Mr. Patine to make sure that we organize to get that video in to the um, clerk and to the council members' hands or devices. Yes. All right. Um, Mr. McVeigh, are you coordinate, coordinating the two minutes? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Lewis will be given our rebuttal. Thank you. We're, we're available to answer questions. Mr. Lewis, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council and the Zoning Committee. I want to thank um, all of you for your time and your consideration. I'm uh, grateful for the support from planning staff. We appreciate that very much and feel like the rationale behind that was appropriate. Um, several points I want to make. Uh, one is we are committing a 48-acre buffer behind the Westmoreland neighborhood. We are going to pave and widen Lake, Mont Lake Brook Road. The TIA, we've just received requests to stop lights at the I-85 and Sam Wilson Road interchange on both sides of I-85, which we are going to comply with. We are in compliance with all critical watershed uh, development standards and intend to uh, operate this site in, in compliance with all environmental laws. Uh, the uses that we anticipate for this site are not uh, negative environmental uses. Um, in addition, on uh, Morse Chapel Road, we are building two 12-foot multi-use lanes on both sides of, of Morse Chapel Road uh, for bikes, for walkers, for runners. Um, so we are we're spending a lot of money to um, provide public infrastructure uh, and to comply uh, with uh, TIA requirements that are in addition to the five and a half million dollars. We anticipate 1,000 jobs and 100 investment, and we're work we're committed to working with the Resource Center, the Goodwill. Opportunity Campus and Charlotte Works. And we've had conversations around that and plan to introduce our prospective clients to these organizations to utilize their job resources and job development programs. Thank you, that's all I have to say. All right, um, now from the council, are there questions for the petitioner or the um, proponents or op sure. opponents? Questions from the council? Ms. Watlington? Uh, my question is um, actually for Mr. Dayoga. In regards to the area plan or the status of a comprehensive plan for this area, can you speak to where we stand? Sorry, I didn't get your question very well. Something sure. I'm just wanting to know what is the what is the status of any area plan update or comp plan for okay. this particular part of Charlotte, and how does this zoning fit into it? Thank you. Um, 
Councilmember Watlington. So obviously, as you know, the comprehensive plan is not uh, done yet, and we're still working on it. Mm -hmm. um, but as we work on the comprehensive plan, it, um, it's not just going to be land use in terms of where they are, but also what the market is telling us uh, today and also uh, in the future. What I can tell you right now is that we don't have enough land area for industrial development. Uh, when we think industrial, when people hear the word industrial, they often think pipe and foundry type of thing. Um, but that's that's not where the challenge is. It's really about jobs related to assembly, um, uh, logistics, for which Charlotte is very well known. Uh, unfortunately, as we lose more opportunities for that type of development, it means uh, competing cities get advantage over us. Uh, so as we look in our comprehensive plan, the effort is where can we create, first of all, we have to rebrand the word industrial and make sure that communities don't always feel intimidated or overwhelmed when they hear the word industrial, that it's not necessarily something that can, um, that can be done adjacent to residential development. And so we need to rebrand and we're working on that right now as part of our comprehensive plan and the unified development ordinance. We'll be sharing that with um, the transportation and planning and environment committee on September 28th, actually on Monday. Um, and so the comprehensive plan will focus on how do we do that, but also how do we create more opportunities for economic growth in the city by leveraging what we have today without broadening residents. It's a tough balance, but we also know that we're losing land to industrial development and we want to be very careful that we don't, you know, uh, put ourselves out of market if we don't allocate areas where we can have that. And typically there will be areas where you're close enough to um, freeways mm -hmm. or arterials uh, where people can actually get in and get out. But we also want to make sure that in the process, we are creating jobs close to where people live, but not the type of industrial development that will create quality of life issues for residents. Thank you. All right. Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I wanted to make the general observation that this is a situation where we have a, a very major rezoning outside of uh, the city limits. And that means that we don't automatically have a process where one of us kind of looks after this. So I did just speak to Ms. Watlington and find out if she would be prepared to, to help us out by performing a kind of district role, uh, engage with the residents and do all the things that a district person does. Because as you may recall, the last time we had one of these situations, it ended up in court. Um, I do have a question about what exactly the uses are that are expected here? Are these going to be warehouses, transshipment facilities? Can we get a little more detail on exactly what sort of things will be going on at this location? Yes, um, excuse me, am I muted? No, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes okay. Um, we uh, anticipate a lot of demand um, and have already you know, spoken with uh, potential clients uh, who are in the uh, logistics business, um, e-commerce. Um, also though, you know, due to the pandemic, you know, we're not only having an explosion of e-commerce, uh, we're having reshoring of critical manufacturing and a lot of manufacturers that are already here and here in our region even are going from a just-in-time delivery of products from their vendors to just-in-case. Uh, and so it's, it's requiring more warehouse space. And in one scenario I'm working on, uh, we have a company that is a large manufacturer in Charlotte region who wants to consolidate uh, several facilities into one large facility. Of, uh, um, and um, I can't mention names at this point, we have non-disclosures, but so in that scenario, you might have a, a portion of the building, <clears throat> excuse me, that would be uh, light manufacturing, um, and then the remainder of the building would be uh, storage and distribution of the product. Um, any light manufacturing we would have would be clean manufacturing. We've, as a company, uh, and as a partner in the company, we've done a tremendous amount of build to suit uh, business for man all different types of manufacturing operations 
including food grade, um, you know, cabinetry, electronics. Uh, all of these are, are clean facilities. And these buildings are built of you know, eight to 12 inch thick concrete panels. Uh, so the noise from these manufacturers is contained within the buildings for the most part. I mean, there's, there's very little noise coming out of any of the operations on the inside. So uh, I guess then one concern is traffic that we heard about. And what is the composition of the trips? I mean, are we expecting that a lot of these trips are going to be tractor trailers or what types of vehicles would comprise the trip uh, volume? We don't know exactly, of course, until we get the, the use. Um, but in the TIA, Randy, um, I believe you're on, I believe that the allocation that is standardized for the industry and this type of thing is it, you're uh, expecting about 25% of the trips to be truck trips. All right, thank you. I, I would just say to CDOT, I'm interested to see your analysis um, and would point out that this is one of those situations where the comparison with the existing um, is favorable, it would be, by right is favorable, but we are going into a place where there isn't anything right now. And so we need to be thoughtful about how we manage that traffic. I think we, we need to be responsive to, to those questions. I'm not prejudging that, but I'm just saying I, I hope that we will get from CDOT uh, some good analysis on how adding that much traffic in that area affects mobility. Thank you. I think Ms. Hall and Ms. Byers will be paying attention to that. And I'd like to also add, um, with the number of jobs and what we're talking about, what does it mean for bus and rail um, as well? So we have several other council members that have questions. I'm gonna start with Ms. Johnson. Thank you, I wanted to thank, Ms., um, thank Mr. Smith, but also Ms. Epps and the other speakers who weren't prepared to speak today and um, who, who stepped up on like a moment's notice. I sometimes some courage, so thank them. I just, <laughs> we can't, we can't hear you, Ms. Johnson. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I think someone just needed to mute. But I have a question for the residents. Were they aware of the 48 foot buffer and the uh, infrastructure improvements? Uh, does that make a difference to them in the way that this project is received? Ms. Epps, I'm going to ask if you don't mind, um, either you take the question or give it to someone because I can't see out of the list of speakers. So Ms. Yes. Epps, the question from Ms. Johnson was, are you aware or were you aware of the 48 foot buffer? and the infrastructure changes such as the lights and the 12 foot multi-use lanes on, on either side. Yes, yes, we are aware of all of those, uh, of those points. And our response to the 48 foot buffer that's left as R3 is, you know, what development would want to come in and build a residential development adjacent to an industrial facility? that although there is a buffer between the existing houses, that regardless that we know what, what industrial proximity to industrial does to land use values and also the way that the property is situated, <laughs> they have to leave that 40, well, they don't have to, but that the, the industrial facilities are fit, situated between two streams with a, quite a bit of topography between them so that extra buffer to the east is a, a result of that topographic difference. And then in terms of the infrastructure improvements, um, Moore's Chapel Road right now is a, a two-lane country road. It is not built for um, commercial truck traffic. And what you heard from the petitioner a minute ago to remind you is looking at something on the order of 500 commercial truck trips a day, 800, that's 18 wheeler trucks. And regardless of what the maps show, we know from living here that the most convenient way to get up to 485 going towards Hunterspell is up Morris Chapel Road or, and then down Sam Wilson to get to Wilkinson. So um, we respectfully disagree that those improvements are gonna make a difference for um, a, a 
two-lane street that's already quite overburdened. E even during COVID, we still have um, heavy traffic backup on Ormores Chapel and Sam Wilson, especially with the um, new industrial facility. And I guess the point is, is that, you know, we understand we have to have industrial. We understand we have to have jobs. Um, and we would argue that there's plenty of room for industrial development along Wilkinson and adjacent to 485 and 85 that would be infilling, um, as opposed to this project, which breaks boundaries into, you know, some of the remaining few tracts of land that, as one of the council members just pointed out, there's nothing there right now. So it's an area that could be preserved for a, a, a different use than something like industrial. And we also, the neighborhood is also well aware that it is just, you know, quote unquote, light industrial. But we also are aware that even with light industrial accidents happen. We have some very good industrial neighbors that nevertheless, we experienced a spill of white soap suds filling up the creek that my kids play in. And that's a, and that's a light industrial use. And nevertheless, accidents happen. Um, in there. So, thank you. I'm sorry to get on so long. Ms. Ashmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a couple of questions. Some of my questions were already addressed. Um, I am looking at the documents that was part of our package, and I looked at the strategic plan, which is Dixie Berry Hill. Uh, and this proposed rezoning is incons inconsistent with Dixie Berry Hill strategic plan. So I want to hear from staff. It is inconsistent with the area plan. Uh, however, staff is recommending the approval of this. So could you please uh, explain why is that? Thank you, Councilmember Ashmere. Uh, the Dixie Berry Hill plan does recommend single family residential. That plan was from 2003, as we've stated in our rationale uh, in our staff analysis that we do feel that the uh, change in some of the landscape in that area in terms of existing development and development that we've seen over the past 17 years or so since that plan has been adopted has been primarily uh, industrial employment type uses in nature, uh, particularly around the interchanges of 485, Sam Wilson Road, Wilkinson Boulevard. Uh, and we felt that the uh, you know, existing development that we have seen out there that is similar in nature to this uh, you know, was consistent more with what we've seen in the area that's been developed versus, uh, you know, some of the things that were adopted in that policy some 17 years ago. So I think some of those uh, improvements that have happened uh, and the location of that in, in between 485, 85, Wilkinson Boulevard and the airport really uh, have a, an area that we've seen that's become from a market standpoint more uh, industrial intensive versus residential that maybe was envisioned when that plan was adopted back in 2003. And I think our rationale tried to outline some of that uh, given those locations along some of those key inter, uh, interstates and interchanges, uh, as well as some of the uh, language in that center's corridors and wedges framework, which does encourage industrial development near interchanges like this. So I think that's where uh, the basis for our rationale came from. While it is inconsistent, we felt it was consistent with the type of development that we've seen since that plan has been adopted in that area. So thank you, Mr. Patton. Um, in terms of infrastructure improvements, what what improvements have been made? It's it's a two lane road, uh, as uh, several speakers have pointed out. Yeah, certainly, and I think that's uh, one of the questions I think that we uh, have heard and, and some of the things and concerns that we've seen from folks in this area as that industrial development has continued. Uh, I think this petition uh, in, in particular has some of those improvements for that realignment of Moore's Chapel down to Wilkinson Boulevard. That is a, a fairly uh, in intensive road project that would be conducted by this uh, petitioner. That's something that NCDOT had identified as a desired uh, roadway improvement, and that's something that this petitioner 
petitioner has come in and, and decided to partner with NCDOT and some other property owners in the area to make that uh, realignment of Morse Chapel Road happen uh, with Wilkinson Boulevard. Uh, they also have talked about uh, infrastructure improvements to Lake Brook Road, which would be almost a complete redo of, of that road and upgrade. Uh, we did hear from the petitioner they are conducting a traffic study uh, currently that's going to be done in conjunction with both NCDOT and CDOT. That's going to look primarily at some of those interchange areas that could result in things like stoplights, uh, other areas uh, of inter infrastructure improvements that uh, we still are going to go through that process. And, and that process actually is something that uh, would be done and finalized during the permitting side. We do have uh, improvements that are identified particular to this rezoning. But even after this rezoning, uh, should it be approved, uh, they might have additional improvements that would be as a result of that traffic impact study that's still in process and in progress with NCDOT and CDOT. So uh, I think there's just there's a multitude of, of some of those infrastructure improvements that would be done both through this rezoning in the conditional notes and then as a result of that traffic impact study, which would be done and finalized likely after uh, the rezoning should it be, you know, be approved, it would be conducted during that permitting phase. So uh, I think that's where we, we see some of those infrastructure improvements coming from. Yes, I appreciate some infrastructure improvements that have been proposed by petitioner. Um, could you bring up uh, sort of a uh, map of the area where it shows the proposed site and then nearby you will see whether it's residential or industrial. Um, could you bring that slide, please? Yeah, that would be, uh, Holly, if you could go to the existing zoning slide. <clears throat> so while you're pulling that up, uh, I, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at our uh, artifacts uh, that was in our package, and I'm, I'm looking at how close the residential side is with this proposed rezoning. Uh, and any time when there is a proposed uh, rezoning that converts, or, or if there is a request where it's asking from asking for a rezoning request from residential to industrial and where there is residential already nearby, uh, that is concerning uh, because there are residents that are already living there and uh, there is a residential site right next to them. I don't know if they expect the industrial site, even if it's light industrial coming right next to their site. I, I mean, that is a concern that I have. So as you can see here, um, Okay, so we got R5 right next to it, and then uh, this side is R3, and then there is industrial on the other side, and then there is multifamily. Um, what is the plan uh, that city has in terms of some of these other residential sites that are already there? Is there a plan to, um, at some point, do you see this uh, area as eventually transitioning into more industrial? I think we've seen and continue to see the area that has transitioned to some more industrial. If I, I can uh, try to work up a, a rezoning history map, uh, I think that's in maybe in our packets. It may show some of the uh, previous rezonings that have occurred out there just over the last five years. And we have had uh, some undeveloped land. It's mainly been the undeveloped land in the area that's been around some of the existing residential that's been looked to have converted to industrial uh, over those last five years or more. Uh, and that's certainly been something that we've seen more of an increase in a trend on. Uh, and it's primarily like I said, been that un undeveloped property and that vacant property more so than uh, taking some of the residential properties and, and consolidating those. We do have some of that that occurs, but they may be larger residential holdings versus some of the more individual smaller lots like we have in, in that uh, area just uh, to along Lakebrook Road, Spring Pine, Thayer Road, and then along Morse Chapel. So, uh, you know, I think we've 
tried to, to work with, uh, you know, the folks that are proposing some of these petitions and, and where we have existing residential development, uh, tried to program some of the property and, and land uses to be uh, less uh, of those noxious industrial uses. That's certainly one area that we start in. And then uh, with buffering and, and other things with noise abatement. And then, you know, of course, the infrastructure improvements that we talked about uh, try to have those, uh, you know, work as, as harmoniously as we can, but certainly there is the potential for some of those land use conflicts when you do have, uh, you know, industrial and residential being neighbors, but our, our role is to try and work through this process to mitigate those and work with both parties to, you know, try and find some commonalities where we can try and abate some of those concerns, uh, you know, and, and I don't think in some of those cases all concerns will certainly be addressed, but I think we try to come out with uh, an outcome that uh, is positive, and certainly I think this one, uh, you know, we can continue to have some of that dialogue with both the petitioner and the neighbors. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's going to be uh, an answer to every question that we have, uh, but I think there's Ms. still Kidman. opportunities. This is Ms. Epps. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Epps, you cannot, I, this question is, I, I, I know that this sounds really, um, but we have to follow the legal requirements for our zoning conditions. So you have to be wait and to be asked the question, and right now the question was asked of Mr. Patine. So um, uh, my apologies. Uh, Mr. Patton, uh, I'm, I'm good. Um, you know, I looked at the history of rezoning uh, in this area, and what I have seen, I've not seen any rezonings that was included as part of our package where it has, where we rezone something from residential to industrial. Uh, okay. Everything that is on here, it's from office to industrial or general business to industrial. I, I've not seen anything from residential to industrial. Okay. And that's, I have some concerns. Um, if I missed it, please let me know. Uh, but I'm, I'm just looking at uh, what was provided to us. The sure. next question I have here is, uh, it's for petitioner. Uh, why this site uh, versus something that is already industrial or where it's not next to residential site? This site represents, um, you know, a great tract of land that is, you know, does not have any, um, you know, land uses on it right now. It is very difficult to find a tract of land like this where you can put a large footprint building. Uh, there are very few of them left in Mecklenburg County. Uh, there are very few as you go into surrounding counties now even. Um, so when the streams that delineate this site that were referred to earlier are, um, are natural boundaries. And, and of course, you know, one of the reasons we left the 48 acres, not a 48 foot buffer, by the way, it's 48 acres next to um, the neighborhood on the east. Um, we had the luxury to do that because we weren't gonna cross a stream and have an environmental impact with the building. So uh, I guess the main answer to your question is, it's, it's the, we're, we've used up the industrial sites. There are not a lot of industrial sites available. Um, and so this, is, this seems to us as a natural extension of the industrial to the south and the industrial to the north. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, staff, could we get a could we get a list of industrial sites that are either light or heavy industrial in this in 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 the city or within the ETG area or within the county um, that is over 100 acres? Uh, certainly, this rezoning is for 156 acres. Uh, that would be helpful. Uh, <clears throat> Other question I have is, uh, this is also for our staff. Uh, what, I guess, uh, what is the, could we provide interpretation service for those who are non-English speakers? And this has come up a couple of times. Um, so if, if there is a speaker who, who wants to speak in Spanish because of the language barrier, could we have an interpreter at our zoning meeting or other council meetings? Ms. Ashmira, I believe that we have tried to do that by request and that's the way that it has worked and that has been going through the clerk's office. Um, the, com 
the question that I've been more often asked is the um, sign language. And I think that that is something I've been asked consistently and I thought we were going to try to do more of um, because of the American Disabilities Act. And so it is um, something we've been doing on a lot of our televised meetings. I think that is something that we will see more of because of the increased um, um, requirements of the law. Um, but if there is a um, language, um, the city clerk's office makes that accessible. Um, in terms of, I don't know if there are other options. I've seen some technology where um, the translations are done in closed caption. I don't know about that. So I think that there's something that if the council discusses, it's um, certainly a valid question. Yes, I would like, to, uh, I would like for us to review that. Uh, as, as we all know, we have a very large population of immigrant community here in Charlotte so that we can make our city services accessible to all of them. So if we can look into how we can accommodate such requests as they are coming in, especially in this case, when I had a meeting with some of the neighborhood leaders, they had expressed concerns around uh, non-English speakers not able to sign up. So if it, if it can be something we can include on our city website, that would be great. Um, so then we can also advertise it. Um, yeah, I think that um, the Office of Immigration um, has been working on the various languages and interpretation on our sites. And so they've been coordinating that. We'll just ask um, Mr. Rios to give us an update of where we are and what options there are available to us. Yeah. All right. uh, one last question I have is for uh, staff. So I'm looking at the proposed trips. Uh, do we or do you all differentiate uh, when we are looking at trips, do we differentiate when it's car versus uh, heavy machinery or truck? Or is it all the same? Uh, I believe we're, we're looking mainly at a volume in terms of number of trips, but uh, I could certainly uh -huh. defer to CDOT if they want to provide any clarification on whether we look at type versus uh, just the volume of number. Ms. Hull, do you want to address that now? Yes, ma'am. And so um, Lakeisha Hull with CDOT, so Dave is correct, Dave Petten is correct. We just look at the volume. We don't go into the type of vehicle with our trip gen table. All right. I have a further update um, for you, Ms. Ajmira. The city's website has a Google Translate button and it says top right and all of this can be done by Google Translation um, by use of that. Um, and then... Um, no, I, M Madam Mayor, I'm trying to understand. So there's the Google Translator. So could anyone go online and sign up to speak? Uh, that are non-English speakers. So if they're speaking, how, would we be able to see interpretation? Uh, and how would we be able to see that? You know, I'm just reading what I've been told. So I'll get someone to tell, tell you how that works. Ms. Jackson will call you tomorrow um, and let you um, know how it actually works. I just, just wanted to make everyone aware that right now on the website, you have a Google translation button that can be used. Now. Um, Mr. Giobi? Yeah, I was also going to say that we, I don't know if it's on yet, but we have um, been working with the office of um, Federico's office, mm -hmm. the immigration uh, office with regards to language line um, for not just for the rezoning piece, but also for um, all kinds of engagement. If you go on the planning website right now, there are probably more than 100 different languages where someone can really communicate with us with regards to questions that they may have uh, on different planning activities. But again, I think I'll work with um, Ms. Jackson to get a response to you. We'll get something back about the 100 languages that are available. Um, I think that, um, let's see, Ms. Ajmira? I'm, I'm, I'm done, thank you. All right, um, Mr. Winston? Thank you. Um, uh, there are a lot of things that seem to be uh, unfair about about this, um, considering this petition right now. And I, I fear that we lack proper policy that will guide us on this decision. 
Um, you know, as, as Mr. Bakari and Mr. Driggs have pointed out, this seems like this could be a very significant um, um, uh, petition that could lead to, you know, a, a great economic um, a development um, uh, project on it. Um, you know, Ms. Jail with, uh, uh, touched on the, the, as we complete the comprehensive plan, we really need something uh, that we've been asking for ever since I've been on council, and it's, it's a guidance around uh, industrial development. We don't have that now. We know that we're losing a lot of land and, and, and uh, a lot of land that could be zoned industrial, uh, and, and, and that's very difficult for some of the, ec the jobs that provide the economic mobility in our city that we seek. Um, you know, I would like to see, you know, I, I don't really know how to weigh this other than a gut reaction. I, I would like to know how this interplays, how this overlays with the airport um, uh, e uh, expansion plan, for instance, because this is the type of project that we would want close to our airport, which is our economic generator. Um, we were having a discussion in, in intergovernmental um, uh, relations today about looking at the I-74 and 85 corridor um, as, as, as a transportation, a smart, a smart transportation um, um, corridor. Um, uh, this is going to be the, uh, close to, uh, possibly close to the future uh, Silver Line uh, uh, alignment, and that's you want this type of um, development uh, that will, will, you know, next to the Silver Line, where there's going to um, be um, 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 jobs uh, to, to take the, the light rail to. It does seem like that we have uh, uh, industrial rezone a bunch of industrial tracks around here um, in, in the past few years, but they are significantly smaller. Um, so I don't know if, if that provides any type of precedent uh, uh, for this type of, uh, this type of uh, uh, rezoning and potential development. Um, and I really just, and I don't, we don't have any good guidance uh, as it relates to putting industrial zones um, in these protected areas, these environmental protected areas. How does this, is this a good idea uh, to put this type of zoning and this type of, uh, of, of potential development um, um, in the middle of many different streams and, uh, and inlets and outlets uh, to, to our wetlands? Um, as Mr. Driggs pointed out, this is an extra, uh, the, the ETJ, um, so I don't know how to necessarily uh, consider future development here. This is, you know, this is land by the waterfront. This is is, is something that that makes uh, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, so desirable. Um, our, our land and our natural resources. So um, I, I'm torn uh, about this. This 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 doesn't seem like um, um, uh, you know a developer coming in and and, and just wanting to. Uh, grab and snatch, as, as he said, you know, we're a growing city and the ability to do large scale projects is becoming harder and harder, but we really need these types of projects for economic mobility. So how do we approach this? Uh, I guess to, to Mr. Jail, but taking all of those, these, these things into consideration, how do we approach this, you know, from a, a, a real a planned um, um, kind of mentality. How do we d use anything besides a gut reaction and and, and a subjective uh, a, a subjective uh, decision uh, between what is good and what is bad for for the common good of, of the entire city, Charlotte, or the or the county, as it may in, the, in this situation. Uh, you want the um, term paper version of that, or or the um, summary, executive summary, or, or and yeah, more? I'll, I'll make a summary. How do we apply a plan to this? Executive summary. How do we apply? How do we? How do we again, we we talked about going from this deal making city to a plan making city. How do we apply a plan here? Because it doesn't really seem possible. So um, usually, in the absence of a plan like what you expect, you look at the pattern. Uh, what, what's been happening in an area for, for a while, and then you balance that with potentially future needs. Um, and that's really where I think council has to fall in here. Um, 
we had said later on in the year that as we draw close to having a draft comprehensive plan, we're going to begin to share certain policies with you that could be applied to this type of um, development where you have, you know, you don't have the right type of um, document in front of you. We're only a few weeks removed from that. Uh, we're going to be presenting this draft document to council at the end of October and releasing it to the public for review. But what you're going to hear, what you're going to see there is consistent with what I said earlier on, and that is that we're going to redefine what industrial use is. Part of the reason why staff supports this is because of the type of industrial use being proposed for this development, um, the road network that's close enough, um, and then the pattern of development that we've seen there over the past uh, few years. I do understand, and we've had conversations with the community, so I, I definitely do get that. Uh, but the comprehensive plan is not necessarily going to be significantly different uh, in terms of what I've just said to you, and that is to continue to make Charlotte a very attractive community uh, for jobs and for residents, uh, and really having to be able to balance between the two, so that as we talk about this notion of creating 10-minute communities, it's about bringing jobs close to where people live, but being the right types of jobs close to where people live, close to where people can travel if they choose to, uh, we've had conversations also even with public transit, but as you know, uh, transit is not something that's driven by shift workers. They have a particular, you know, schedule that they have to, to run by. And so maybe the conversation has to be uh, with the developer or uh, whoever, you know, the business is that is going to go here with regards to what kind of transportation would you provide to your employees in the future that will minimize, you know, many vehicle trips from those who will be working in this place in the future. Again, I'm just speaking out, uh, understanding that some of these things will be reflected in the overall plan. So, again, you've got to look at the pattern of development in this area uh, over the past few years, look at the transportation network that is close by, and then also think about what the future brings in terms of the development of our city. That's, and then you make your decision from that place. Thank you. I would uh, love to spend uh, uh, some time, you know, um, personally speaking to the residents, speaking to the developer, but also understanding um, from, from staff, for instance, you know, how do we, how do we really approach these, these protected areas? Um, and how do we apply, how do I apply, at least I uh, apply uh, uh, planned logic uh, to this decision because it seems like it's going to be a very important one. Thank you. All right, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I'm going to piggyback a little bit on Mr. Winston's comments. Um, I have I have spoken to the neighborhood group. I've spoken to the developer, and I drove out to the area, and um, I, and I'm trying to wrap my head around this because in the past few years. We have talked a lot about the fact that we're losing area for light industrial in Charlotte. And it, it really speaks to the need to get a, not just a comprehensive plan done, but to map out what that comprehensive plan tells us. Because the comp plan isn't a map, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Tyrell, but that's just, that's the plan that then has to be laid out and says, this is what it's gonna look like. And I think that's really important right now to fit that we need staff to give us some guidance because this is a big project that is dissecting a very big residential area. And if staff says to us, most likely this is where light industrial and logistics are gonna go, this is where the development's gonna continue, then we need to know that and residents need to know that because these people invested in homes in this area and land and there has to be some predictability for residents and for businesses as to what this area is gonna look at like. So I do feel that, um, I mean, it's, it's a major change. I rode up, drove up Morris Chapel Road and frankly, as it is, was a little scary. It's got a lot of bends to it. If you were a, a cyclist, I think you'd have to be awfully careful. Careful. So I'm really happy that the developer is talking about 
multi-use paths on both sides. But right now, I don't know how you put that much tra traffic on there for trucks. Um, I think you explained how they get onto 85, but, but I couldn't figure that out from Morse Chapel, but you're saying it's really not from Morse Chapel Road, it's from um, Lake Brook, I guess, out to Sam Wilson. So I, I have to understand a little bit more about that. Um, but I, I just feel like we need a little bit more help from staff on this one to help us understand where you really think light industrial is going to go. It's a very important part of our economy. It's a very important part of our airport because we, we could be the premier intermodal facility in the southeast if we had all of our intermodal pieces right there by the airport. Atlanta doesn't have that. Memphis has it, but pretty much because of FedEx. And we really could be the premier, premier uh, intermodal facility, but we, we need some help here. We need some help in, in deciding where this is most likely going to go, and I think that's only fair to the residents. Um, the last comment that I would make then is about traffic, and Ms. Hajmira touched on it. What my question was is, I don't know how you do that traffic estimate if one you're really saying that cars and trucks are the same thing, are both vehicles. It's just not the same thing. If you get stuck behind a couple of trucks or you get stuck behind three cars at a stop sign, your timing is very different and the, the impact on the environment is very different. So we need a little bit more help on that. And, and with regards to the possible uses, um, we heard that it could be manufacturing, it could be logistics, but um, Alan, as you said, logistics has, has changed, especially with the pandemic, that it's not from just in time, but to just in case. I can order something today and have it that afternoon. And we all have seen the increase of FedEx trucks up and down our streets. So that tells me that's a lot more in and out traffic. And so I don't know how you come up with the same traffic number if it's manufacturing as you do if it's just in case warehousing. So. Honestly, I just feel at this point we need more information from staff. Um, I need to understand a little bit better how staff went from saying that they weren't sure about it because of it, it was supposed to be residential to it's going to have traffic improvements. How, how do those two really, how do those two arguments align? And if it's because you really feel this is going to be our light industrial region, then you need to, you need to tell us that. So. Uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Mr. Bakari. Yeah, I, I'm, I won't add much. I think much of what I was going to say has been said. I'll just kind of recap to say we've had a lot of conversations these last few years that I've summarized down as almost, you know, the industrial gentrification of Charlotte. And we've talked about it a lot. And, and as much as we love a booming South End in all of these areas, it's at the cost of a lot of the industrial capabilities we once had in this city and the home they once had. So I think the bottom line is we're going to have neighbors, whether it's this case or whatever case, when we actually get a plan where this is going to go, they're going to absolutely hate us for having that plan. Just, at, you know, full stop right there. So I, the fact that the, 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 the opportunity for us to get a plan in the time of this decision is impossible. I don't think that's going to be something we're going to be able to have. So staff has told us, um, you know, that this is, these are the precedents we've seen. These are the, the reasons we've gone through to have our support of why this makes sense. I think they've gotten some fair questions for follow-up for more detail that we need to see. But at the end of the day, I see an opportunity with a trusted partner, not someone coming in town trying to make a few bucks, but someone who has a track record and is a part of this community to build something here in finally an area that still allows for it and it's possible. And it is in an industry that, you know, whether it's, you know, I, it, if I saw just in time, right, I'd say that seems like it's aligned to the 1990s. Why are we doing that? When I see this, I say, wow, that may create additional traffic and trips, which is a problem. And we have to be cognizant of that. It's also aligned with where the industry is going, where logistics is going. I think that's critically important as we talk about the economic impacts we're looking for in addition to the land use decisions we're ultimately going to make in these plans. So it's not going to be an easy decision, but 
I think we've gotten probably 90% of the answers that we're going to get in the time of this decision. And staff's going to have the ability to add 10% more. And this, if we're going to use our time effectively, probably needs to be an exercise in finding concessions between the petitioner and between the neighborhood that could make something we know we need to do uh, a more optimal and more of a win-win for both sides. Thank you. So I think everyone has spoken. I just wanted to add that I think that the Ms. Bakari Ms. hit on what I was going to really think talk about. We have studied we have studied this idea of industrial property jobs logistics um, having the airport as a hub for um, both. Um, the economic around this, creating good paying jobs and all of those things. And we've been joined in partnerships. The COG has done studies around this area, the intersections and the, um, and the highways in that area. So we're going to have um, this question of how do we manage this idea that we're going to have to create jobs that pay well, because if we don't pay jobs within our city, then people have to go further out. That means they have to have higher paying jobs, higher costs, because transportation is a major component of any household's income these days. But I, I don't know that it's um, as difficult. I would like to see the, the data that we have, the pieces that have been worked on for the years, put in some central way that we could say, if you were to take a conclusion from all of the work that's been done in this area, what are the top three things that the, um, those studies aspire to for, for our city and especially our county? But the bottom line, I think, we've been doing a lot of negotiation on rezonings, um, and we need help from the developer here. I think that this could be a model development, but it requires some flexibility, some ideas of what ought to happen, and ways to make it a livable community. Um, I think about the places where, when we built the um, Blue Line, you know, when you go out to the north and southern rails tracks along Noda, and you think about it, there was a negotiation there about here you have a modal yard. I mean, it's a rail modal yard with lots of track, lots of industrial uses. And I'm not sure if anybody really thinks about it. it took us almost a year or more to negotiate how to treat that property. And it was a heavy industrial site. It was one that necessarily, um, for me, I've often wondered about its environmental um, standards. In this case, you have land that you want to create something that would provide jobs, would provide opportunity. Um, there may be people that are willing to live closer to it because they don't want to own a car anymore, that they are willing to bike to work or walk to work. So, um, so going, Mr. Bakari has asked the question, um, what are the existing plans? Mr. Winston has asked the question, how do those plans fit together and what, does, what do they mean? And I believe the Mayor Pro Tem is saying, without a transportation plan, how do you actually make something work out there? And that transportation plan ought to be considered just like our mobility plan, not just because of trucks and cars. It ought to be about trails and bike lanes and the roads that we need to do. So um, to the developer, I say, help us. Um, to the neighborhood, I say join with us and try to um, think about the people in this community whose lives can be changed by having the access to a good paying job, as well as for the developer to think about how do we make sure that people that live in the area don't feel that they've been forgotten because they're next to an industrial site. Um, we can do industrial sites that look like an urban center that we can all be proud of. Maybe we just haven't thought about it or maybe we, want to, we don't want to pay for it. Those are all choices, but at some point there'll be a decision made about this. So with that, do I have a motion for closing the public hearing? So moved. There's a motion by Thank Mr. Driggs and Mr. Graham to close the public hearing. Um, so all in, I'm sorry, um, Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Winston? Mayor, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. My hand's been up for a little while. 
I am so sorry. I did not have it on my list. So I, I'm, I know. I'm sorry. I, I did have one other question. Um, Ms. Epps mentioned that there was a, a spill in the water near her home. And I, I wanted to kind of ask her about that, but also ask the question, do we consult with, with OSHA? Because we're not engineers, or most of us are not. We do have one on council. But even if I pull up the, the uh, environmental report on, on this petition, there's information in here that, that looks like it could be concerning, but I really don't know. So what I would like to see um, in future zoning um, if we can get an environmental report, uh, what happens in our reports is says, um, you know, see the zoning notes. But when you pull some of these up, they, they do look like that there should be questions that we might ask. I think that's what happened in that other petition that was in the ETJ that we have a lawsuit on. So I, I'd like to be informed more about the environmental impact of uh, petitions, especially when we're looking at putting industrial in, um, in neighborhoods, if that's something that we should be concerned about. So I don't know if anyone has from, from the staff has the zoning uh, or the environmental report handy, but- um, I don't think that we do. I think it references, see the comments at the rezoning. Um, I don't see that we have it in front of us right now. I, I'm reading the Mecklenburg County Land Use and Environmental Service C advisory comments on the rezoning website. I, I, I haven't pulled up. Right, I, mean, I can just give it a brief now, overview of them. Uh, the first comment from Groundwater Services just does indicate that there's a potential contamination on site or within 1,500 feet of the property. That's mainly just an advisory comment uh, that identifies that there was a contaminated site at some point, and there would have to do, uh, you know, potentially some things about. Uh, if they develop the property, they need to be aware that there could be contamination. Now, this site would be uh, built with water and sewers, so that wouldn't necessarily apply uh, to that. It's mainly, again, just to identify that we have made a note that there wasn't contamination within 1,500 feet of the property, and that there would be need to, need to be additional measures taken to ensure that uh, you know groundwater is is taken into consideration when the property is developed. Uh, the stormwater services comment just denotes that a floodplain permit would have to be obtained, uh, you know, during that development process should this rezoning be approved. Uh, and then if anything is built within that flood pl hazard area, uh, they would need to meet the, you know, community-based flood elevation. So uh, those are comments that we generally get for petitions that have floodplain on the property or that may have a contaminated site from a well uh, in that area, uh, but it doesn't preclude any type of development it really doesn't fall into any kind of uh, play in, until they would go to a permitting situation if the rezoning should get approved. So uh, it, it wouldn't, I think, fall into any kind of uh, detriment of potential development of the site. It's more just a note for uh, uh, just putting them on notice for when they go into permitting. Okay. And then if I could ask Ms. Epps, was that what you were going to, um, I think you, you were, you were mentioning something about about this, this spill. Um, did you want to add anything else for Ms. Epps? The, the spill that I was referring to had nothing to do with this rezoning petition, but the, the property, um, it's more to make the point that even with environmental regulations, even when pro industrial properties pass environmental um, check marks in terms of what they must comply with, that the probability of environmental impact will always be higher for an industrial use than a residential use. I have a PhD in geology. I'm a professor of earth sciences at UNC Charlotte. So um, I have a background in environmental sciences and can speak with that, uh, can speak to that, um, to, to the peer reviewed literature that shows the overall impact of industrial not necessarily that this site is may or may not be complying with environmental regulation. All right, that thank you. We have a motion on the floor to close the public okay. hearing. We have a, a second, Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Yes, second. Mr. Graham. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Um, I believe we have Mr. Winston. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. 
Um, Ms. Ashmira, is there yes. anyone objection to object an objection to closing the public hearing? Hearing no objections, we're ready to uh, move forward to the next item, which is um, item 32. Wait a minute. Did I just do? Did we do 32? Yes. Yes, we did so 32. 33. So we'll be at the 33. Yes. Let me get my glasses. Um, item 33. It's a petition 2020 by 066 Europe Development Company for approximately 3.6 acres located on the north side of Sardis Road and District 5. The current zoning is single family, three units per acre. The requested zoning is urban residential conditional. Staff recommends approval upon outstanding resolutions. And um, in this case, we have um, people. Three, four people speaking in favor. Mr. McVeigh, I'm assuming that you'll coordinate. And we have two people speaking against, Mr. William Wright and Ms. Wel Rachel Nel Nielsen. Um, and so we will have the staff presentation, then we'll have 10 minutes for each side, and then two minutes for the rebuttal. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. 2020-066 is 3.62 acres. It's on the north side of Sardis Road at to the intersection of Sunnywood Lane. Uh, the existing zoning for this petition is currently R3. The petition is proposing to rezone the property to UR1CD. Uh, the adopted future land use for this area is from the South District Plan, uh, which was adopted, I believe, in 93, and that recommends single-family residential development at three units per acre. This particular proposal proposes 18 single-family detached homes on individual lots. Uh, they would be uh, consistent with our residential height, which is 40 feet, have internal access uh, via shared alleyway uh, with connections from Sunnywood Lane and Sardis Road North, uh, be a minimum of 20,000 square feet of internal improved open space. Uh, pedestrian refuge island would be installed across Sardis Road northeast of Sunnywood Lane, as well as an eight-foot planting strip and six-foot sidewalk on both Sunnywood and Sardis Road North. Uh, landscape screening against existing single-family homes uh, as noted on the plan there in green and also some architectural standards uh, for the uh, homes that would be built on the site. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have a few outstanding issues to work through on uh, technical revisions for site design, transportation, and tree save. Uh, it's consistent with the South District Plan recommendation for single-family residential development. However, it does exceed the density recommendation. Uh, when we have the South District Plan, we do apply the General Development Policies, or GDP. Uh, those GDP uh, policies do support up to eight units per acre, which is consistent with the density recommended uh, for this petition. Uh, so again, we do recommend uh, approval and be happy to answer any questions following presentations by both uh, the petitioners and members of the community. All right. Mr. McVeigh, are you coordinating the um, proponents of the petition? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we will be. I will be. And right. thank you for your time. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of the Zoning Committee. Keith McVeigh with Moore Van Allen, assisting York Development, York Development with this rezoning request. Uh, with me tonight is Ahmed and Aiden at York. Uh, there are the petitioners and property owners. Also, Paul Purnell with uh, Urban Land Design, Urban Land Partners is also available to respond to questions. As Dave mentioned, and hopefully we'll be able to get up our presentation shortly, uh, a 3.6 acre site currently zoned R3. The proposed use would be for an 18, uh, 18 home, single family home, uh, pocket park and neighborhood. Uh, with a density just under five, acres, five units to the acre. Uh, 18 single family homes range uh, to front on Sunnywood Lane and then on an internal common open space. Uh, a pocket neighborhood is a small cluster of homes in urban or rural settings that are arranged in a, around a, a common open space. In this case, we have a roughly 20,000 uh, 20, square foot plus common area in the middle of the site uh, that are, are the single family homes are arranged around. Uh, as Dave mentioned, we do have tree safe areas, landscape areas, uh, screening around the perimeter of the site to act as a transition to the other existing single family homes that are adjacent to the site. Uh, we will be making improvements to Sunnywood Lane with curb gutter and a six foot sidewalk and a planning strip. There will be additional improvements to Sardis Road North in terms of a sidewalk uh, and planning strip. 
and, and then additional common open space that actually also fronts on Sardis Road North. It looks like we're not going to be able to get our presentation up for some reason. We'll be happy to email that to you. Uh, other matters in terms of traffic, again, a very modest increase from what 10 units could be developed on the site today to a, a total of 18, keeping with the single family nature of the area, so 18 single family and detached homes. They will be two to two and a half story homes, predominantly two story. The half story is a really a potential to have a, a unit within, maybe try the next slide, maybe have a unit, uh, some heated space in the attic, in the attic space of the, or in the eaves of the, of the home, so not a true third story, but two to two and a half story home. We will have two, two car garages. Uh, in terms of traffic, as I mentioned, a very modest increase actually only adds uh, seven more cars in the AM and, and nine more cars in the PM in terms of total traffic. Uh, we are also contributing money to CDOT for the installation of the pedestrian hybrid, hybrid beacon along Sardis Road North to allow residents on the south side of Sardis Road North to cross Sardis Road North and use Sunnywood to access, I think it's McAlpine Greenway. Uh, we are also uh, pro providing a pedestrian refuge island in Sardis Road North as part of the development of the site. Again, and uh, um, unfortunately our presentation isn't coming up, we do have images of the homes and the common open space, how they would be improved, uh, and some of the tree safe areas as well. There are some large trees on the site that are being preserved, specifically at the perimeter of the site, adjacent to the existing homes. We've had several meetings on the site with the residents that have been very uh, polite and cordial and have asked good questions. One of the things we did do, thank you, um, maybe maybe you can go to the site plan again, so site plan that is the site, a little bit about what a pocket neighborhood is. Next slide. Uh, there's the, here's the, there's the site plan. There, maybe if we go to the next images that are, keep going for the images, next image please. There's an image of the pocket park neighborhood. There's the common open space that the fronts home, the homes will front on. Uh, that will be improved and maintained by the Homeowners Association. Next slide. Uh, and this is a view from Sunnywood looking, Sunnywood Lane looking back. The, there are four homes that front on Sunnywood, uh, keeping the residential character of the local street. Again, as I mentioned, the, the homes will be designed to front on the street. Each car will have two car garage and there's 18 on-site visitor spaces for visitors as well as the, the garage spaces. Next slide. Uh, over 58% of the site will be actually left in open space areas, the, uh, roughly two acres with the open space in the middle, tree save and, and other landscaped areas. Uh, the improved open space is, again, no less than 20, approximately about 28,000 square feet actually what's shown on the site plan. Next, next slide. I believe this is our last slide. And again, uh, a pocket neighborhood is, is a different type of single family neighborhood trying to create a little different environment for, by having single, home, single family homes that are arranged around the common open space while still addressing the neighborhood character by fronting on the street and providing adequate buffers and landscaping. We're happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right, we have two speakers in opposition. You have 10 minutes to um, state um, your opposition. Mr. William White and Ms. Rachel Nielsen. Mr. White or Ms. Nielsen? Yes, this is Rachel. Uh, we have a presentation that was uploaded. All right. Do we have that presentation ponied up? Right now we've just got the staff recommendation. recommendation. And uh, Minister White will take approximately the first two minutes and I will take approximately the, the following eight. All right, um, Reverend White, did I hear that appropriately? 
Uh, no. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I thought oh, she said okay. Minister White, so. No, it's not. It's uh, just uh, Bill. Bill um, just Mr. Mr. White, please. Yes. Um, I want to thank uh, the Madam Mayor and the City Council for allowing us to address this meeting. My name is Bill White. I live uh, on Sunnywood, right directly across the street from this proposed development. If we can go to uh, slide two, please. Uh, that's slide three. Okay, uh, this is the overall drawing. Uh, Keith showed a, a little sub drawing of this. Uh, that red circle or square down at the bottom is where they're requesting the rezoning. All this yellow is R3. Uh, there is no high density development outside of the uh, growth and transportation corridors. Uh, so this would be pretty much unique. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the Southern uh, District Plan is um, pretty, it, it's, it says that uh, all the, the very first bullet point says single family homes uh, should be a residential density for the Southern District of three units per acre. It goes on to say that it would take privately initiated zoning based on the following locational criteria to allow housing densities higher than three per acre. One of those is a half mile from the transportation corridor. We are not. Independence is as close as transportation corridor. It's a mile and a half away. Within a half mile of a commercial and or employment center or a public park. McAlpin Park is over a mile and a half away. There is a very small um, uh, little mall, well, not a mall, just shopping center, a gas station, movie theater. Uh, there are a half mile away, but they are not in any way really a commercial or, or employment center. Um, the other things about uh, floodplains, trees, uh, just not applicable um, large-scale mixed use in the area. There is none. So really, this does not meet any of the requirements, and it's supposed to meet all of them. Um, all right. The, uh, it, it goes on to say that, uh, oh, shoot, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, the, uh, You're fine. It, yeah, the existing neighborhoods are supposed to be less densely um, developed, uh, should be protected. Uh, my house is directly across the street from this development. As I said, I'm on over an acre. Um, the house next door to me is on over half an acre. All the houses around us are a third of an acre. Um, these, store, these houses are, are saying to be two and a half stories high. I don't quite understand what a half a story is, but um, there is no house above two stories high within a mile of this property. Uh, so uh, I, I just do not see where this fits into our, our neighborhood at all. And at this time, I'd like to turn this over to Rachel uh, so she can continue, please. All right. Ms. Nielsen? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm a local resident as well as a local architect and here with my husband, who is also an architect um, and resident. Um, in terms of the center corridors and wedges framework, uh, this site is in an area defined, defined as a wedge area. Uh, like Bill mentioned, it's over a mile and a half from a transportation corridor and over a half a mile from Monroe Road. Um, again, those are those are the transportation corridors. Um, looking at the rezoning history in the area, those other properties that have been rezoned are directly adjacent to Monroe Road, uh, which again is much more commercialized and much more developed uh, than this R3 residential area. Uh, next slide. Um, one thing that we are extremely concerned about on this project is um, a, a lack of um, adherence to some of the land development standards from the city. 
Um, shown in front of you is detail 11.19C, uh, um, calling for a tw minimum 20 foot wide pavement for a fire lane. This is, again is a residential alley detail, single loaded for two way operation, which is currently shown on the site. Um, that says that there are no cut slopes, obstructions, hedges, et cetera, on the non loaded side of the alley. Next slide, please. Um, what you'll see from that city detail is that the city detail measures 20 feet starting from the inside of the valley gutter and curb and measuring outward towards the non-loaded side for the 20 feet. You'll see in the detail provided on the proposed plan um, by the developer that that detail is actually measuring in the opposite direction. It is taking the measurement from the outside of the valley, including that entire valley curb area and measuring it inward towards the loaded side. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're very concerned about this because this is a hazard to local development, has limited access and incorrect access um, by fire trucks. It's a hazard to the surrounding development um, of all of the neighborhoods, all of us residences um, nearby is because of limited access by those fire trucks to that area um, with increased risk for, um, for fire and other emergencies. Um, without that correct access. Um, it's a significant life safety hazard to pedestrians and kids. So that sidewalk you'll see in that detail below, that sketch below, that is what is proposed currently in the detail. That sidewalk is part of the fire lane, which means that if you have any uh, pedestrians, you have kids out there, um, even a trash, uh, a, a trash bin out there would impede the, the truck. And also because the residences are so close together and so close um, to, to that 20 foot fire lane that there is nowhere for those residences, uh, those pedestrians to go. Uh, if you have a mother out there with a stroller, she's got to get out of the way somehow very quickly um, to get out of the way of that fire truck. And uh, in addition, this proposed detail establishes a precedent for unsafe standards moving forward. Um, this detail should allow for pedestrian movement safe from emergency vehicles, should maintain the required 20 foot fire lane, keep the fire lane more than two feet away from the nearby buildings, which is what's currently shown. And uh, in, in addition to that, if this sidewalk is moved to the other side of the street, that impedes on the minimum tree safe area that's required um, along those, that's, that is those buffer zones and those tree safe areas along the sides of um, between this development and our neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it was mentioned that the parking allowances were increased. What we originally shown was about um, four to eight spaces for the entire development, and that has been increased to 18. Um, that still only allows for three total spaces per unit, including the two spaces in the garage. Uh, these driveways are not deep enough to park a car in. All local precedents and um, developments, including similar pocket uh, developments like this, um, higher, uh, closer towards uptown on Sardis Road, um, establish a minimum of two to three spaces per unit in addition to those garage spaces. Um, the neighborhood has significant concerns about traffic and parking in their neighborhoods because what is provided is not sufficient. Um, as we mentioned, this is not on a transportation corridor. It's over a half a mile um, from any uh, nearby areas. So we are not in a walkable neighborhood per se there. Um, no houses over two stories are located within at least a half mile radius. A few other items, site triangles are not addressed. Um, in order to make those site triangles um, be 35 by 35, it includes, includes improvements on another um, property. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we were told that R3 zoning uh, was not going to be able, we were told multiple times it would not be able to be done here without doing detention on site. Um, this quick diagram shows that is possible. Uh, next slide, please. And in summary, uh, the proposed development we believe is inconsistent with the local development and South District plan. We have actually over 480 signatures on an online petition uh, that has been sent to city council or will be sent after this meeting in opposition to this development. 
and public safety is jeopardized over the dense development. So the, the what we showed before with the diagram on um, that detail uh, for the, the fire lane. Um, and we believe that in order to meet these land development standards because of the buffer zone and the tree safe areas, that there are significant modifications that would need to be reviewed and allowed comment prior to I, Your time is up. I um, thank you very much, um, Ms. Nielsen. So right now we go to back to the, um, the petitioner who has a two-minute rebuttal to, regarding your opposition. Mr. McVeigh. Um, yes, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. So uh, first to address the general development policies and the South District Plan criteria, uh, as it states clearly in the South District Plan, there may be policies or other plans that have been approved since the South District Plan was approved in the early 90s that supplement some of those uh, land use criteria that were mentioned by, the, by, by Rachel and Bill. And that's what's happened since 1992, 1993, when the South District Plan was approved. The general development policies have been adopted. The county and the city council adopted a base density of four units to the acre for all parts of the city. And then indicated through the general development policies that certain sites like this site, which you will find in the general development policies are applicable to, can be supported for densities above four units to the acre if they meet certain criteria which as the staff has mentioned, this site actually meets that, that more recent uh, land use policy and supports dwelling units up to three units, to the, up to actually eight units to the acre, which is 29 units. We're proposing just under five or, or a total of 18 units. We believe we have provided adequate parking in addition to the two spaces in the garage. There's actually one additional space for each unit within the, along the private, or dr along the private drive. We don't want to sacrifice more of the open space for parking that may never be used. And again, we feel the parking that is provided is adequate. Uh, the fire lane and the access drive have been reviewed by the fire department and will be continued to be reviewed by them during the land development approval process should we get supported. A 20 foot lane is needed for the fire department, not for travel, but to allow them to park and extend the supports for their larger vehicles. Obviously, the, 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 there's enough room for the vehicle to move up and down the street once it stops and needs to extend. Mr. McVeigh, your two minutes are support. up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and we'll be glad to answer questions. Thanks. All right. So are there questions, um, Ms. Jackson, from anyone on the um, virtual part of our meeting? No questions there. Any questions from the council members here? Hearing no questions, do I have a motion and a second, Mr. Driggs and Mr. Graham. Um, so any discussions on the closing? So Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Ms. Eisel? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. All right, we have a motion. Anyone object to the closing of the public hearing? All, everyone's in favor, so that hearing is closed. Our next petition is um, item number 34, um, petition 2020-067 by Terra Nova Group for approximately 2.9 acres located at the 2400 block of Mecklenburg Avenue in District 1. Um, I think all of us are familiar with Mecklenburg Avenue. Um, the current zoning is um, three units per acre residential. The proposed zoning is urban residential conditional. Staff recommends approval um, cons upon resolution of issues. Um, we have in this case, <coughs> excuse me, um, pe two people, four, um, so the staff will present and Ms. Marion, Hain, Mr. Haney, Mr. Collins, and Mr. Janess, um, if you would, you would have 10 minutes together. And then Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith, or Amanda Smith and Mr. Smith, I have no assumptions here I should make. Um, you will have 10 minutes followed by the petitioner having two minutes for a rebuttal. So with that, we'll turn it over to the staff. 
Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020-067, it's just under three acres. This is, as we stated, on Mecklenburg Avenue, right there at the corner of uh, Mecklenburg and Matheson. This is the location of the historic Shaw House. The property is currently zoned R3. Uh, the proposed zoning is UR2 conditional. Uh, the adopted future land use for this uh, property is from the Central District Plan, which was adopted in 93. Uh, it does recommend single-family detached residential uses up to four dwelling units to the acre. Uh, this proposal is for a maximum of 11 residential units. Eight of those are single-family attached uh, within four principal buildings, and then we also have three single-family detached units. Those are located primarily up on the front end of the property uh, closer to Mecklenburg Avenue. Maximum height for all structures is 40 feet consistent with residential zoning. Oh. Internal circulation would be provided oh. by a proposed private alley. There would be an eight-foot planting strip and six-foot sidewalk along the site's frontage along Mecklenburg Avenue, and there's also architectural standards as a part of this proposal. Uh, the main crux of this proposal uh, this evening, and we'll certainly let the petitioners discuss more, is for development around the historic Shaw home that would help to uh, ensure its preservation. Uh, I'll let them speak to that in a little bit more detail, but just wanted to provide that back background uh, from a staff perspective. We do support uh, this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to environment and site and building design. It's inconsistent uh, with the central district plan recommendation for single family detached, uh, but it is consistent with the overall residential density of up to four dwelling units per acre. So again, it's really just inconsistent with the housing type uh, with some of those detached units on the back end of the property. Uh, but again, staff does recommend approval of this and we'll be happy to answer any questions following comments uh, by both the petitioner and the community. Thank you. The petitioner will have 10 minutes. Good evening, everyone. This is Brian Genest. I'm chairman of Cole Genest and Stone. Um, if you want to, if you could just flip a couple of slides, we'll get you the pictures of the house. And oh, I we've like talked a little bit about some of these things I was going to mention. I'm so pleased to be with you tonight to discuss the renovation and redevelopment the shop property in Plaza Midwood. As you can see, it's a significant property. It's three acres. It's one of the largest tracks in the area it's right there near Charlotte Country Club. Um, this house was slated for demolition. It was coming down and had approval to be removed. And through the efforts of Dan Morrill and the Preserve Mecklenburg Group, which is a group of citizens in Charlotte, which I'm a member, we came together, we got a contract to purchase the house, an assignable contract. We put together a plan, we met with staff, we found a developer, and we've been able to save this house and put together a plan in a real, in a context sensitive way. And I'm so pleased to be part of this. <coughs> I'm sorry? Oh, we've all seen so many of these places go down because they're not economically viable. This is a great example of something that is economically viable and will contribute to the neighborhood. Had this gone down, this would have turned into a cul-de-sac with, with eight houses that would have been oversized and crammed onto a very small piece of property. We've seen this happen over again. So we're really pleased to see this hopefully come to fruition. This is the first project this group has done. A little bit about the history of the house, built in 1928 by James Knowlton. He was a Duke Power executive. Um, in 1944, a man named um, Victor Shaw purchased it. He was a mayor of Charlotte. His claim to fame is the Charlotte Coliseum on Independence Boulevard. The mayor also proposed a zoo and that the city purchase an elephant, which never came to fruition. So he was a colorful character. So some significant folks have lived in this house um, over the years. Uh, a little bit about the developer, Terra Nova. Rob Haney is on the phone and can answer some questions. He is a group out of Greenville, South Carolina, has done several projects of this um, nature. If you could flip a few more slides to the site plan, I'll just quickly, I'm just keep, keep going, please. Uh, one more. This is a picture, this is a, the slide that was mentioned earlier. There are two houses that will flank the existing house, which is right there in the middle. There are quite a few trees to be saved. And then on the back side is eight R8 um, duplexes. It's geared toward empty nesters. Actually, several of the folks who live nearby have expressed interest. There's going to be a private alley around the back. And uh, we're, we're most excited about it. One more slide so you can get in and see what these um, places are going to look like. Okay, so that's all I have to say, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much. And I like the mustache. 
Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so now we'll hear from Mr. Miss Amanda Smith and Mr. Brad Smith. Hi, this is Amanda Smith. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Mayor Lyles. Uh, I am a near adjacent neighbor with sight lines to the property from my um, home and property. I oppose this development, and in addition, the Father Midwood Land Use Group opposes this uh, petition. Uh, the reasons why I oppose is because this site is deep inside a residential neighborhood based on large lots. Uh, it is not near development or in a density corridor. There are no businesses nearby and there is no public transportation nearby. There is no multifamily nearby. To add increased density would be inconsistent with the neighborhood and would not make sense, especially uh, once the two flanking homes are built quite close to the Shaw home. Right now, this property does allow the, the uh, build and development of additional buildings, so it is not a hardship on the developer, but instead, uh, more can be done on this site within the current zoning. This developer has already engaged in removal of trees that are shown on their site plan that were just now referenced as being saved. However, they are already gone. That work took place over two days and it disrupted my ability and my neighbor's ability to do work, given that there is a significant work from home posture and the plans currently call for a 24 month development process. It is not consistent with an established neighborhood having this much work being done. As I mentioned, there is a removal of trees that would be required by this, and it would be replaced by asphalt and concrete and building footprints. Given that the recent tree canopy report came out citing the need to uh, really preserve our trees, particularly mature existing trees like this, that can't be well replaced by nursery stock. It doesn't make sense to approve this much of a footprint and uh, in increase the density zoning. Furthermore, this site does not provide for any sort of public good to offset the negatives of density. Uh, there is no plan for community use anywhere, no open spaces that are public, community gardens, playgrounds, that sort of thing. And this density will uh, be an extremely expensive piece of property to purchase. Uh, so this is not something that is workforce housing that makes sense. Um, Given that there's no offset, given that, as the mayor pro tem mentioned, neighbors need predictability for residents out of fairness when she was discussing another project, it is not appropriate to change the density on this when there is nothing else around it like that. And in fact, it would create an anchor property that, as others have mentioned, then developers in the future would hang their hat on in order to say, well, the, the Shaw property was already developed. What's the difference in developing mine? There's no call for increasing density within this deep within a large lot residential development. And I would ask you to oppose this. Thank you. Thank you. Is Mr. Smith also going to speak? Yes, I'm here. Mr. Smith? Yes. You have a few, how many more minutes? 6.30. You have, you have six minutes left of the 10 minutes in opposition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, good evening uh, to the mayor and city council, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, voice my opinion. My name is Brad Smith. I live uh, uh, Caddy Corner to the site at 2124 Matheson Avenue. Um, I'm opposed to the rezoning of the Shaw site from R3 to UR1 for the higher density development. Um, I would I would much rather have the cul-de-sac and the uh, eight home sites that were described previously over um, redeveloping the site like it is. And uh, you know, I appreciate and commend the developer and its partner, partners and team who wish to preserve the historical Shaw House, but I, you know, I think they're failing in that effort. Um, I've never seen a historic site to be preserved by increasing density and development next to it, um, but it just doesn't make sense. 
Um, I think the rezoning of the site sets a precedent for the immediate area as well as for the rest of Plaza Midwood. Unlike some of the other sites, uh, this site is not on a major thoroughfare like the plaza uh, where one of the other similar sites was rezoned to UR1. Um, uh, I think the site could also be subdivided into flag lots and still keep the historic home site in place and restore the home site like it is. Um, so that's possible another option and keep the R3 zoning. I don't know if the developers or the team has looked into that. Um, the, uh, the alleys, I do not believe a planning and design standpoint is, is the right move for a subdivision site like this. Alleys are typically secondary access routes for subdivisions, not primary use routes. Um, for any of these homes, if they have relatives or friends come over to visit, they're not going to have, um, I don't believe they're going to have adequate space in the parking lots or the garage area to park, and they're going to park on the side of the alley, which blocks access for the fire trucks and emergency vehicles. Um, I think that's just a poor plan and an accident waiting to happen. I think it jeopardizes the safety of the public. Um, Luckily, I live upstream from the site, and um, I noticed the pond is at the lower end of the site. There's about a 25% grade difference between the low end of the site and the high end of the site. Um, I, I would not want to live downstream of this site if that pond fails. I know the pond has to be designed to meet regulations, and I'm sure it will be, but it's, that would be a concern as well. Um, that's, those are the list of my comments. Thank you for your time this evening and appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. McVeigh, you have two minutes to rebuttal, for rebuttal. You're talking, I, actually it's Brian. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I am reading okay. the wrong sheet. It, I, know. Oh. I know, it's the mustache, right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, All right. I just, beg, I just beg to differ with these folks professionally. I mean, the cul-de-sac in here in eight houses would be completely out of character with this neighborhood. It has been done, but it's not in keeping with what's happening here. We have, there are alleys all over this neighborhood and the alley is very much a part of this neighborhood. The preservation of trees is much more likely when you cluster rather than put a cul-de-sac and, and separate lots. And the other thing that we're trying to do here is to provide a housing type that doesn't exist in this neighborhood. There are a lot of folks who have lived here for a long time, as I mentioned earlier, that are interested in this. They're interested in it because this is a housing that is going to attract an empty nester or an older resident. And there's not a lot of that in this neighborhood. So we're trying to provide a housing type that doesn't exist in a way that we can preserve the house. This house will not be preserved if we don't do this thing creatively. So it really started with the house and the preservation of the trees. If some trees have come down, it's because the trees are unhealthy. And yes, we will lose some trees, but the majority of them are hopefully to be saved based on what we're doing here. So um, I, I made as many notes as I could, and we'd be happy to meet with these folks. We tried to talk to them earlier, but all of the folks that we've talked to here before have been very, very supportive of this. I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you might imagine, I have a good deal to say on this one. In my district and a historic preservation project and one that thanks to uh, my friend and mentor, Dan Morrill, I got pulled into probably a year or two ago at the very, very early stages of discussion. So I am first and foremost uh, quite appreciative of any effort to save one of our historic landmarks and one that was truly in imminent danger uh, to the idea that we don't use uh, adding density to a site to preserve a historic landmark. Uh, I would encourage Mr. Smith, I, probably only a couple hundred yards as the crow flies, there is the Kramer Barnhart estate that is over near the corner of Country Club and uh, Matheson. And we just in the last two years maybe, um, while I was still in the Historic Landmarks Commission, so I guess three years ago, um, the Historic Landmarks Commission purchased that 15-acre site, uh, was able to save the historic Barnhart Kramer estate on one acre of land, and the rest of the site was redeveloped, and that was literally the only way that we could possibly save that historic home. Um, 
So it's, it's not only been done, it's been done almost literally within a stone's throw of this site that we're discussing tonight. Uh, the, the density here, though, is really, it, it, it is undoubtedly significantly different than the density as it exists today, but it is not significantly different than the density that's allowable today, which is really what we often have to look at. The R3 zoning um, allows for three units per acre. This proposed plan is 3.71 units per acre. So a change from three to less than four is not significantly different uh, than what's currently allowable. I do share, uh, I would also note there was a statement made that the Plaza Midwood Land Use Committee is in opposition to this petition. I have in the last five minutes confirmed to someone on that land use group uh, that they did not actually oppose or support this petition. There were mixed feelings about it, um, but they were um, happy for the ability to save the home, had some other concerns that are shared, I know, by the Smiths and some of the other neighbors, but um, did not actually oppose this petition. So one of the things that has been brought up uh, in a couple of emails that I received as late as today that I'd like the petitioner to address is what portions of the historic Shaw home are being removed as part of this redevelopment? Okay. The, um, you want me to do that right now? Yes, please. The, you can see the house in this diagram. There is a piece of the garage, the garage, which is on the far right as you face the house, is to be removed. And can the very up, small- Can you pull up the picture of the home? I think that might be easier. Um, okay, if you could pull that back up, please. And Rob, hey, you're listening in, so if I get this wrong, um, correct me, but if you can go back to those pictures of the house, that would be helpful. Is that possible? There you go. Um, okay, so if you're looking at the house, to the far left, this la this one, um, which was not original, is being removed, and then this far right end, which is where the garage is, yeah. this piece right here. So the main house and this little edge and the, uh, this piece and this other piece, which is right here. So is using the windows as a reference point, around the main front door, the five windows on the main home, is that the only structure, only piece of the structure that would remain? No, the, 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 four, the four windows around the house and then this wing to the right of the house where the, um, you can see the dormer window. Can you see my cursor? I don't know if I'm, I have uh, control. We, we've got, I think it's, this it's hard to see in here, but there's a, fine. there's fine. a, there's a, um, I'm sorry, this is Ben Collins. Okay. Can I interrupt for a second? Absolutely. Send the very, paper. Sorry. Um, but as you see the, the main house, the center and core of the house is the, the structure. And then on the right side, the that shoulder, if you will, and the breezeway that is uh, clabbered and the garage are all original and the left side they had done at some point in the 60s a late 50s or early 60s had done a, a renovation and added the, the two shoulders of the house were identical at some point our goal is to tear off only the left side and bring it back to what it's uh, as what you see on the right side, we decided that we wanted to, to keep, which is makes the the, the prop property of the lot on the right side a little more difficult to have an, a building envelope. But the breezeway and the garage are original, and there's a servants' quarters above in the garage that is quite unique and extremely interesting and, and as far as we feel like a very timely um, point of reference to today's environment that we live in. So the left side would be reworked and go back to much more of a what it was originally and everything on the right will remain oh, okay. per our current site plan. It doesn't show that on the, the original or the, it hasn't been updated 
but it meaning the, the plan that's proposed, but that's the goal that we have at this point, and we know that we can make it work with the two homes facing Mecklenburg. And that might be a discussion I want to have with you all offline, because I doubt many of my colleagues are as interested in getting into the weeds on that as I might be, but there were concerns from some of the neighbors that I couldn't directly address um, that there were portions of the home that were original that were being removed. It sounds like you're saying that no original portions are being removed. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So there was a misunderstanding there that I think is really important that we clear up. Um, yes. And I, an offline would be interested in having maybe a deeper conversation with you because, you know, I, I'm sure you considered it, but I would, um, I think it might be worth considering further what impact to your project it would have to not remove any of the home. Um, but we, we can have that offline if you'd like. Yes, and just to clarify, there was some question of what was original and what wasn't, and I think we've done some additional digging and determined that some things that we th thought were not are, and the, uh, the goal is to preserve everything that's original to the house. So we can certainly talk about that in more detail. And this home, though it yeah. unquestionably has a, a great deal of historic value, is it is not a local historic landmark currently? The property is designated, yes. It is designated locally or it's yes. on the National Register? No, it's local. It's, 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 it's an historic landmark. But the other piece of this that's significant is as part of this purchase, this house will be a, a conservation easement is to be placed on the house, which it can never be destroyed. Right. You know, historic landmark, after you get it, you can get a certificate of appropriateness for demolition and after a torn down, which is what was happening here. So this house will actually be preserved in perpetuity, no matter what happens to the site moving forward. Yes. Yeah, Brian, Brian, this is uh, um, Rob Haney. I'm sorry, I was having problems getting unmuted. Guys, I, I don't, we, we need questions. We can't have just a dialogue here. <laughs> I think that Mr. Eggleston has said that he would be glad to work with you yeah. guys offline to go into some of this. So. But one one other thing, then, have you gone through the design review process or the design review process with the Historic Landmarks Commission? To, yes. Somebody we, probably needs to be. So they we have, have already. Gone through, we have preliminary approval, which means the site plan has been approved to the extent it's as far as we have taken it. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to get them comfortable with the concept come to you all, get it rezoned, and then go back to them with final plans. So it's sort of a three-step process. But they have given you a, a, some deal of confidence that they would be um, supportive yes. of the plan yes. as, as it's drawn. Yes, yes. All right, well then we can take the conversation about um, which pieces of the house, or what's staying, what's going offline, but um, I do yes. want for anybody watching to clear up the idea because I was concerned too when I received a couple of emails that stated that they, their understanding was that some original portion of the home was to be removed. That was not my understanding, but I thought maybe something had changed. So I'm glad to hear that's not the case and glad we were able to clear that up. Um, and again, there might be some, some details we need to work on around the edges of this, but I am, as I stated at the beginning, greatly appreciative of the efforts that Dan Morrill and the development team and everybody else involved has taken to try to find a solution um, for what would have otherwise been just a teardown of a historic property and still an increase in density of the single family homes that would have been added to it, but um, without the preservation of, of the Shaw House. So thank you again. Thank you so much for your help and support thus far. All right, do we have a motion to close the public so hearings? We have a, Mr. Driggs, followed a second by Mr. Eggleston. Um, did someone ha else have a question, Ms. Jackson? Okay. Or snored. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so the um, we have a motion to close the public hearing and a second, um, Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Winston. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Newton. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Is there anyone that objects to the closing of the public hearing? Hearing none. 
We'll move to item number 35. Um, petition 2020-035 by CCP University for approximately 49 acres located on the south side of IBM Drive. Um, it is in District 4. The current zoning is single family residential and research RE2. The proposed zoning is urban residential conditional and R8 multifamily unit, eight units per acre. Um, the staff recommends approval upon resolution of issues um, in this case. We do not have anyone in opposition, so we'll have a staff presentation. And I'm going to assume Mr. Brown will be coordinating um, the four speakers, Mr. Um, Sean Tooley, Bo McIntosh, Dan Melvin. All right, Dave. All right, thank you. 2020-035, 49 acres, Neal Road and IBM Drive, uh, just around the University City area. Uh, this petition is requesting zoning from R4 and RE2 to R8 MFCD. Uh, the proposal uh, is uh, has policy from the no Northeast District Plan 1996, which does call for single-family residential uses up to four DUA. Uh, this petition is requesting up to 300 residential units. 250 of those would be single-family attached, and then 50 of those would be multifamily units. Uh, 45 feet would be the maximum height for all structures, as well as a mixture of public and private streets. Uh, Eight-foot planning strip, six-foot sidewalk along both Neal Road and IBM Drive, as well as those sites internal streets, architectural standards for the buildings, uh, as well as detached lighting, full cutoff uh, with maximum height of 21 feet as being proposed as part of this project. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues to work through related to transportation as well as site and building design. Inconsistent with the Northeast District Plan, it does recommend single-family residential at up to four DUA. However, again, in this case, GDP policies do play into this petition, uh, which is supported for up to eight units per acre for the site, which would be consistent with the R8 MFCD petition or re rezoning being requested. This petition falls into about 6.1 DUA. So again, we are within that eight dwelling units per acre uh, that's uh, identified in the GDP. So again, staff does recommend approval. We'll be happy to take any question uh, following uh, the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. All right, Mr. Brown, three minutes. Um, Thank yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Colin Brown, on behalf of the petitioner. Uh, Dave, give a great overview. In the interest of time, uh, we have a presentation. Maybe you could just go to slide eight. Uh, Dave gave a nice overview, uh, almost 50 acre site here, uh, proposing a mix of uh, some apartment and townhome units on the site, which we think will bring some um, new housing options into an area that is really rapidly changing and, and in demand. Oh, I'm driving the slides. Here we go. Just jump here. This is, uh, as Dave went through, this is a look at our um, facility. And I did want to point out, I know there are no speakers, but there has been robust communication between some of the, uh, the residents and Council Member Johnson. Uh, we spoke as recently as Friday. What you've got here is, here's Innovation Park, so a lot of density development taking place. Here is a CMS campus that has Vance uh, and the uh, Governor Village STEM Academy. Um, and here's our site. And on the other side, you have some you know, single family homes on large lots. They're still on well water. So you've really got a transition from a very traditionally rural area to a highly urbanized area. We think this uh, development plan provides a nice buffer and a nice transition between those. Obviously, you know, when we're developing next to neighbors that have had a very rural environment, uh, any change uh, can be a little bit shocking. So I think um, I think the team has done a nice job of trying to provide a natural buffer between the sites. We will continue to have conversation with some of these um, owners over the next month before we come back to you for a decision. Happy to answer any questions you have. So how many units of how many units are you building? Uh, this rezoning is show, we're showing 300 units on 49 acres. So that density is only about six units per acre. Okay, and okay, but because of the spacing and the use of the land, you've got to do a, okay, the buildings are clustered. All right. So that's it. These okay. are townhome units here and two apartment buildings here, which leaves, you know, almost half of the site is open space. All right. All right, are there questions for the petitioner? Any questions? Hearing no questions, do this, I have a most? I'm sorry. Not, Who is just, it? Mr. Winston. I just have one comment. That's not yes. a question, but I'm just looking at the, you know, the, uh, Mr. Brown mentioned the vicinity to Vance High School. 
And just looking at the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools portion of this, I think this is just another example. I, I don't know how, how to interpret the numbers and, and the, or the impact on schools. Um, you know, I think again, just 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 for the record, I think we got to get better about putting future land use plans or future CMS plans um, in collaboration with one another. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson. Sorry, I thought you could hear me. Thank you. So I have been speaking with um, Colin and um, because we are, I have heard terminations regarding the changes. There are some concerns and some questions about the impact of this development on well water. And we've, we've talked about that. And um, I think the, the neighbors, and, and, I can and we can continue to work with Colin, but the, the neighbors wanted some type of guarantee that there would be no runoff or no effect um, on their water system from this new from development. Also, if you look at the environmental report, there are some comments regarding the air quality and development, um, and that the uh, proposed development is likely to require the use of um, some special type of equipment. So I wanted to make sure that that would be considered as well in the development. So can, can, can you speak on the um, quality uh, or the impact on the well water um, from the development of I can. I think we have Dan Melvin on the line from Land Design, uh, an engineer that is working on some of the water quality measures. Dan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, good evening, guys. Um, found the uh, the well water question to be an interesting one. Um, we we did some research um, digging into some DEQ standards uh, for construction of new uh, wells for water supply, and found the. Uh, the minimum separation for new construction uh, of buildings to be 25 feet away from well waters and the buffers on this site exceed uh, 50 feet from the uh, from the single family properties and we're happy to follow up with um, some of the neighbors on that and they're pretty involved you know so, but there's certainly no point source pollutants on this site this would be, there could be some runoff, um, but as you can see on this plan, there are a number of BPs which would handle um, stormwater quantity and quality. So we would treat those before they leave the site. Um, and we're happy to talk with the neighbors about the locations of their wells. We think they're sufficiently distanced from any development on our site. Okay. And then there was also um, a concern in the report or, or, or comments in the report regarding the air quality and um, recommending um, that during construction there be a specific type of equipment. Uh, can, we, can we discuss that also or can you comment on that? Yes, those are advis advisory comments the departments provide anytime we have a, um, a development within proximity of certain uses, including a school site. Um, the presence of the CNS site um, flag that for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions for the petitioner? Hearing none, we have a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Um, Mr. Drake, followed by Mr. Dr Graham. Um, so, Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Drake? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Thank you. Does, is there anyone object, who objects to the closing of the public hearing? Hearing no further objection, the next item is item 36. The petition is 2018-034 by Charles and Ellen Gray for approximately 0.7 7 tenths of an acre located on the southern intersection of University City Boulevard and District 4. Current zoning is neighborhood business conditional. The proposed zoning is neighborhood business conditional with the site plan amendment. Staff recommends approval upon resolution. Um, we have one speaker um, in favor of the petition, Mr. Patin. Thank you. 2018-034 is uh, about three quarters of an acre at the corner of University City Boulevard and John Kirk. 
uh, drive. Uh, this petition is requesting to go from B1 conditional to a B1 conditional site plan amendment. Uh, that amendment would be primarily to allow all uses permitted in B1, excluding residential and some auto-centric uses. Uh, the amendment also would remove the building size limitation from 5,000 square feet, which was on the previously approved plan. Essentially, the conditional plan that was in place uh, currently doesn't really allow for a lot of redevelopment options or opportunities for this site. So the B1CD site plan amendment would try to open up some additional uses uh, and remove some of those limitations, like I said, on building size that would facilitate some redevelopment uh, of the site and maintain that B1 zoning district. We do recommend approval of this petition. We have a few outstanding issues related to site and building design we still need to work through. Uh, it is inconsistent with the University of City area plan for residential uses up to 22 DUA but again, the, the consistency in maintaining that B1 zoning would maintain those historic retail uses that have been on the site uh, and be able to, again, facilitate some redevelopment of that corner uh, with uh, additional retail uses that uh, could continue to serve the University City area. Uh, so again, staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Mr. Brown. I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, Colin Brown. Sorry, yes ma'am, Madam Mayor, Colin Brown uh, on behalf of the petitioner. Um, as Dave covered and we have a slide presentation, I don't know if we'll, uh, here we go. Um, this is the site of the old, the venerable Gray's uh, bookstore in University City. Uh, we're, we're working with the Gray's family. Uh, the issue here, this site has uh, been a retail site for many years. Uh, the problem with the current zoning is the current zoning of plan only allows one use. And the only use allowed on the site is a bookstore. Uh, I think all of us know the challenges uh, that we've seen with bookstores, uh, with the, the new technologies and everything that they are facing. So you know, the, the goal of this rezoning is just to remove that limitation to just bookstore and allow other uses allowed in the B1 district. Happy to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions for Mr. Brown? Hearing no Move questions, we have a, a motion second. to close. Second. We have a second. Um, all in favor, Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Um, Mr. Graham? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Anyone object? All in, um, that, with that, the hearing is closed unanimously. Um, the next item on our agenda is item number 38. Um, this is by Novant Health, so um, Mayor Pro Tem, if you would just lead the discussion here, that would be very much appreciated. Yep. So this is um, item 38, petition 2020-023 by Philip Neal Spiro. Uh, uh, Ma Mayor Pro Tem, this is, uh, so, I'm sorry, 2019-163. This is 37. Oh, 37. Yeah. Oh, I, what did I say? I'm sorry, I meant the item number 37. I just read the wrong number. The petition is 2019-163 by Novant Health. Got it, thank, thank you. you. Sorry, excuse me, Julie. Approximately 23.75 acres located at the west corner intersection of North Fryon Street and West Mallard Creek Church Road. It's Council District 4 and Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is MUD O, which is mixed use development optional. The proposed, proposed zoning is mixed use development optional site plan amendment. Uh, and staff recommends this approval, the staff recommends approval of petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to the site design and environment. And I don't have the information in front of me as to whether or not there are speakers for or against. I believe we do have speakers for. I'm not aware of any speakers against on this petition. Uh, but yes, we do have speakers for, and that would be uh, Mr. Keith McVeigh, Matt Stein, and Randy Goddard. Okay, so they will have three minutes after uh, staff presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, so 2019 163. Uh, it's just under 24 acres at North Tron and West Mallard Creek Church Road. As mentioned, we have a current mud O zoning on the site currently. This proposal is for a mud O site plan amendment. Uh, the adopted future land use from the Northeast District Plan adopted in 2000 uh, is for office and retail for the site. 
this proposal is for a site plan amendment for up to 144,000 square feet of medical and general office uses. Uh, there are some optional provisions on the proposal that would include an allowance to allow parking in both of those development areas to be between the buildings and the street, uh, as well as uh, not requiring doorways to be recessed. Uh, those are mud provisions uh, that, again, they're asking to opt out of. Uh, we do have multiple transportation improvements surrounding the site, which would be turn lanes and queuing storage, uh, as well as an eight-foot wide planting strip and a 12-foot multi-use path along both uh, West Mallard Creek Church Road and North Tryon Street. Uh, we do have urban open space at the site as denoted on the plan that uh, uh, also commits to architectural standards as well as pedestrian connections from all buildings to uh, proposed sidewalks. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. Again, just some outstanding issues related to site design and environment that need to be worked through. Uh, it is consistent with the Northeast Area Plan recommendation of office and retail uses. Uh, and again, we do recommend approval and we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following Mr. McBain's presentation. Thank you, Mr. McBain. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, good evening, Mayor. members of the Council Members Zoning Committee. Keith McBain, assisting Novant with this rezoning petition. With me tonight is Matt Steen with Novon, uh, their Novon Health, available to answer questions, as well as Randy Goddard, transportation engineer with DRG, also available to answer questions. Uh, I think Dave has done a great job explaining the petition to you. Uh, our site plan amendment to allow the development of the site with a medical campus with a, a variety of medical uses, medical office, clinics, uh, surgery centers, emergency centers, and, and potentially a health institution as well. There was a traffic study conducted for the site. It does call for improvements along West Mallet Creek Church Road at the intersection of Mallet Creek and North Tryon, as well as improvements along West Mallet Creek at I-85. We will work with the staff to address the remaining site plan issues. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, and no opposition to this so does uh, council have any questions? Move to close. Second. All in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Mayor, I have to ask for. Mayor Pro Tem, I so Ms. Johnson, did you, do you mean to have your hand up? I yes, did. Okay. But that's okay. I was going to say that I've had a chance to talk to Keith, and I'm looking forward to this uh, additional medical services and the uh, improved infrastructure in District Four. So I, I agree with the closing of the petition as well. Of the hearing, okay. Uh, and did, I didn't see any other, their hands are up. So with that, we'll close, uh, vote to close the public hearing. All in favor, say aye. Uh, or do I roll call? Roll call, please. Yeah, roll call, please. Mr. Eggleston? Keep not, going. Not He's absent in the, in the, uh, out of the room right now. Okay, Ms. Um, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Winston? Yes. Mr. Uh, Ms. Hajmira, I see you. Yes. Just counting whoever I see. <laughs> and uh, I vote yes at six. Is there any in opposition to close, closing the public hearing? With that, uh, we move on now to item number 38. Thank you for item number 38, petition 2020-023 by Philip Neal Sparrow for approximately 10.9 acres located on the southern side of John Gladden Road, uh, north of Wilkerson Boulevard, outside the city limits. The current zoning is um, residential manufactured housing in the Lake Wiley protected area, lower Lake Wiley protected area. The proposed zoning is I-2, um, general industrial Lake Wiley protected area, lower Lake Wally protected area. Staff recommends approval upon outstanding resolutions. And on this one, we have um, an opposition. Uh, Mr. Carmichael, I would expect you will follow with Mr. Smith and Mr. Sparrow. And then Ms. Ms. And I don't know if this is a Mr. or Mrs. Ms. Cook would be in opposition. So we'll go from there. Dave. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020-023, uh, it's just under 11 acres. It's on John Gladden Road, which is just north of Wilkinson Boulevard, just off of Sam Wilson. Uh, 
the existing zoning is RMH, which is residential manufactured home. It's also uh, has the Lake Wiley protected area and lower Lake Wiley protected area as overlays on the site. Proposed zoning is I-2 conditional uh, and would maintain those uh, protective overlays for Lake Wiley as well. Uh, the 2020, or excuse me, the adopted future land use for this petition is from the Dixie Berry Hill Strategic Plan, which was adopted in 2003. It does recommend single family residential up to four DUA for the site. Uh, this proposal itself is uh, consists of two development areas, both development area A and B. Uh, development area B is the main area that uh, we'll focus on that limits uses on that site for off-site parking and outdoor storage. There are no proposed buildings associated with the site. It is uh, only to allow uh, off, uh, off-site storage and parking uh, for an adjacent use. You can see a red arrow there that says driveway connection. Uh, those sites are really working together um, and they will, this development area B would serve as the storage, additional outdoor storage and parking for uh, that site that's just there to the south where that driveway connection would be. Uh, manufactured homes allowed to be remain on site in development area A uh, until that is redeveloped. Uh, once those homes are removed, they're not able to be replaced. So if we lose one, uh, you know, over time, we're not able to replace those. So uh, over time, you know, we potentially would see that area be redeveloped. Uh, no access being provided to the development via John Gladden Road. Everything would come through that driveway connection uh, shown with that red arrow just to the south uh, of the property. Staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to site and building design and transportation. As we mentioned, it is inconsistent with the Dixie Burial Strategic Plan. Uh, we still feel that it is adjacent or compatible with adjacent industrial development in the area, uh, as well as some of the surrounding land uses, primarily because we're not proposing any access off of John Gladden, where that residential development currently is. Uh, we're also not looking at any uh, new buildings that are being proposed as part of this project. Again, it's just mainly for off-site storage. Uh, and we, again, recommend approval, and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, following presentations by both the petitioner and the community. Mr. Carmichael? Yes, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, thank you. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm the presenter here. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council and the Zoning Committee, I'm John Carmichael, and I'm here on behalf of uh, the petitioner, uh, Neil Sparrow. Um, with me tonight are Danny Sparrow, Neil Sparrow's son, and Brian Smith of Urban Design Partners, and they're available to answer any questions. Um, next slide. Can that um, it's not moving, but well, I'll. Well, the site contains approximately 10.9 acres and is located on the south side of John Gladden Road, west of the intersection of John Gladden Road and Sam Wilson Road. Uh, the site is owned by the petitioner, and the petitioner also owns uh, parcels of land located immediately to the south of the site, between the site and Wilkinson Boulevard. Um, Yes, thank you. The site, the rezoning site is in green. Next slide, please. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the rezoning site is in green, and then to the south, you'll see several parcels of land uh, located between the site and Wilkinson Boulevard. And I have another slide that really depicts this, but those are also owned by the petitioner. The petitioner has operated a patent business on the adjacent parcels of land since the mid 1980s. Next slide. Uh, the site is currently zoned RMH, which is manufactured housing, as Dave stated. And the request is to rezone this site to I2CD. And uh, the parcels to the west of the site are currently zoned I2CD and I2. The parcels to the south are zoned a combination of I2CD and I1. To the east, uh, the parcels are zoned uh, residential manufactured housing immediately to the east and further to the east, there's zone I-1. Across John Gladden Road, there are parcels of land uh, zoned uh, R-3. Next slide. Uh, under this rezoning request, if it were to be approved, there are going to be two uses allowed on the site, off-street parking of motor vehicles, including trucks, tractor trailers, and vans, and outside storage. 
there would be no buildings that could be or would be constructed as part of this rezoning request. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so this is the rezoning plan. As they say, that the site is divided into two, develop, uh, two development areas. The western portion of the site is called development area A. The eastern is called development area B. Uh, development area A, A contained on the west contains the existing manufactured homes. And these homes would remain on development area A until such time that the residential use expires naturally. Upon the cessation of the residential use, development area A could be devoted to the uses proposed under the rezoning plan. Until that time, a 75-foot Class A buffer would be located on the western boundary of development area B next to development area A. Um, the reason the manufactured homes are remaining until they, the use expires naturally is that uh, these are longtime residents of or tenants of the petitioner, and the petitioner does not want to force anyone to vacate. So the residential use will just expire by its terms when folks decide uh, to vacate on their own accord or unfortunately if they when and if they, they pass away. So he does not want to eliminate, eliminate that use as a result of this petition. So once again, development area A would be devoted to the existing use until such time that it's, it's redeveloped. There'd be a 75 foot buffer between um, the, the use that would, the development area B that would be devoted to industrial uses. There would be a 50 foot class, C, class A buffer along um, the site's fringe on John Gladden Road, a 100 foot buffer and tree safe located along the eastern boundary line of the site. Tree safe area would also be located along the eastern boundary of the site. At such time that development area A is converted from the residential use, a class A buffer would be established along the northern boundary of development area A. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> An important component of this rezoning request is that access to and from the site would be limited. As I previously mentioned, the petitioner owns the rezoning site, which is in green, and adjacent parcels of land to the south that front on Wilkinson Boulevard, which are outlined in red on this exhibit. Vehicular ingress and egress for the rezoning site would only be from Wilkinson Boulevard through the adjacent parcels of land outlined in red, and John Glad Road could not be used for vehicular access. The only exception to that statement is that the existing residential uses on development area A could continue to use John Gladden Road for ingress and egress as they currently do. But this in yellow, the residential access would remain until such time that the residential use goes away. When development area A is no longer used for residential purposes, then development area A cannot use John Gladden Road for ingress and egress. It would have to use the adjacent parcels of land owned by the petitioner and access would be from through the adjacent parcels of land from Wilkeson Boulevard. So once again, the only access to John Gladden Road would be for the residential use, not for the, uh, invest, the I2CD use. And as soon as the residential use expires, there will be no access to John Gladden Road. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, Wilkes, you know, Wilkeson, on Wilkeson Boulevard, the silver line is proposed to be located eventually. And this area could change as a result. And then some of these parcels would be appropriate for Todd, uh, a Todd zoning designation. Uh, the petitioner feels that this is a, uh, a reasonable interim use of the site because there'd be no buildings constructed on the site under this rezoning plan and no buildings would be allowed. So at such time, that the silver line is extended, the station's constructed, and there may be an opportunity to redevelop parcels in the area for transit-supported uses, and then the parcel in question would be easily converted because once again, there would no be no buildings or improvements uh, on the site. The only uses would be parking and out, outside storage. And once again, the petitioner's been in the community since the mid-80s. Um, if anyone has any concerns, the petitioner's happy to work with him as he's always done, and, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time and your consideration. We will work with the planning staff this week to resolve the outstanding issues, which will be easily resolved. 
Thank you. All right. Are there any questions for Ms. Oh, Alyssa, I'm sorry, Ms. Cook, Lynn, Lynn, or Mr. or Mrs. Cook, Lynn Cook. So that there is a caller. There is a caller on the phone. If that is you, Ms. Cook, we have taken you off mute, so you can talk. Okay. All right. So um, that means that we have. No rebuttal. Is there, are there any questions for the staff or for Mr. Carmichael? Mr. Winston. Mr. Winston. Uh, yes, so obviously we have um, not necessarily an analogous uh, situation. Um, it, it is another um, um, in industrial uh, rezoning that we don't really, I don't know if we have a lot of guidance for, but when you say manufactured homes, um, you're, to, you're referring to trailer, trailers and trailer parks. That's right. Um, yes, so basically what we're, we're talking about is the elimination of uh, a level of affordable housing uh, for the parking of trucks and vehicles, open land. Well, they, eventually, but, um, and, and Dan Sparrow's on a lot, but these are long-time residents or tenants of Sparrow's. And so, uh, Councilmember Winston, those folks, the, the, the units would only be vacated when someone passes away. A lot of them are elderly, uh, elderly, or if they choose to move. So this, re he's not looking to, to ask anyone to move as a result of this rezoning. That's why he's, div he's divided the rezoning plan into two development areas. That's why he would put the buffer between the two uses. Um, but, but you're right, once someone moves out, then a particular unit would be removed and it could not be replaced. I, I think we'd have to ask the staff to remind us when we um, made a determination on uh, manufactured housing and that it was a decision that was made and I'm not sure when, but I, I'm sure we can get you the information on um, that decision that was made several years ago. I remember one being at Sugar Creek and, um, oh my gosh, in Tryon, I think. Um, a huge manufactured housing development there. The difference has been, I think, that the, the city decided manufactured housing versus, and I'm not quite sure what you call the trailers are, but they, they did make a decision a long time ago, and I don't remember when it happened, way before I came here. So that's why I think Mr. Carmichael is saying that as you see the phasing out, Mr. Winston. Well, the, the, the re I'm sorry, Ken, I'm sorry, Mayor, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I'm, I was just saying that's the city's policy now or ordinance right now. So are there any other questions? Yes, Madam Mayor, this is Dimple. I wanted to follow up with you. Uh, I didn't catch the city policy. Could you please explain that again? I, it, on our zoning, we, the city decided, and I don't know, before I moved here, that um, there would no, no longer be um, the trailer manufactured housing. Manufactured housing has changed a good bit. Manufactured housing is allowed, as I understand it, but not the tr um, trailers that are usually up and able to be moved around. That's, I don't know what you call those. And, okay, so we can certainly get information about that. To you, but that's as I, I would, Mr. Carmichael wanted to answer. Yeah, and and, and, and because it, the property would be, re, if it were rezoned, it would be, it, um, I guess, irrespective of the city policy or in addition to the city policy, if the rezoning were approved and the whole site was rezoned to I two CD, then the manufactured homes would be a legal non-conforming use, and so when you remove one, you couldn't replace it. But once again they would only remove one when it's been vacated. And if you have any questions about the history of, of the mobile home park or trailer park or manufactured home park, then Mr. Farrow is happy to answer any questions. Oh, oh, staff, could you just include that in a follow-up report and I'll just review that. And if I have any additional questions, I'll reach out to you. Thank you. Ms. Mayor Lyles. Uh, yes. 
I would just like step in that follow up report. Will we consider this um, a net loss of affordable housing? Okay. Um, so, are there any other questions? Do I have a motion to close the hearing? I have Mr. Driggs a second, Mr. Graham. Um, so, uh, Ms. Watlington, Ms. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Ajmira. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Is there anyone that objects to closing the public hearing? Hearing no objection, that passes unanimously. All right, we're on item 39, um, petition number 2025-055 by Rangewater Real Estate for approximately 27.9 tenths acre located on the east side of IBM Drive in District um, 4. The current zoning is research. The proposed zoning is um, multifamily 17 units per acre residential conditional. Staff recommends approval outstanding after outstanding resolutions are met. Um, we do not have any speakers in opposition, so Mr. Patine and then Mr. McVean, will you organize Mr. MacArthur and Mr. Walls? Or I can call on you in the yes, order that you listed. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, 2020-055, just under 28 acres on IBM and W.T. Harris. Uh, the, petition, the property is currently zoned RE2. The proposed zoning is R17MFCD. Uh, this uh, petition is part of the Adopted Future Land Use for the University Research Park Area Plan. That's from 2010. That calls for residential office and retail uses for the site. Uh, this petition proposes up to 300 multifamily dwelling units. Uh, the access is proposed uh, to be provided via IBM Drive along with a dedicated left turn lane to improve uh, traffic safety. There is a 12-foot multi-use path commitment along with an 8-foot planning strip along IBM Drive as well as dedication of land to Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec uh, for future greenway development along Doby Creek. Uh, it also commits to programmed open space for the site and architectural standards for the buildings proposed. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. As mentioned, we have uh, some outstanding issues related to transportation transportation to continue to work through. It is consistent with the University Research Park uh, area plan for residential office retail uses. Uh, and again, staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, following presentation by the petitioners. All right, Mr. McVeigh. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening again, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Town, members of council, members of Zoning Committee, Keith McVeigh, assisting Range Water Real Estate uh, with this rezoning petition. With me tonight, as you mentioned, is Palmer MacArthur with uh, Range Water and Dennis Walls with the land design and they're available to answer questions. We do have a brief presentation. I think Dave has done a good job describing the site. Uh, Range Water Real Estate, uh, formerly known as Pollock Shores, originally founded in 2006, a uh, multifamily community doing work in, in the southeast and southwest, uh, selected as a multifamily Builder of the Year, Home Builder of the Year, Multifamily Builder of the Year in 2015, won uh, an award in 2000 last year from the Charlotte Business Journal for Apartment Community of the Year. Uh, they developed an apartment community on West Tremont in the south end part of the city. Next slide. Uh, you mentioned the site, about almost just under 28 acres, zoned RE2. Next slide. Uh, and again, as Dave mentioned, 300 units, up to 300, 400, in, a, in up to four buildings, uh, amenity area. There is a uh, greenway dedication to the county along Dobie Creek uh, that runs adjacent to the site and will provide access to uh, Mallard Creek Greenway eventually once it's developed. The petitioner has been working with University City Partners on the planning of that Dobie Creek Greenway. Uh, we'll be building a 12-foot multi-use path along IBM that will also connect to the Greenway and the, um, one access point to IBM. And as I mentioned, we will work with the staff to address the remaining issues. Last slide, please. Um, and then again, just uh, adding some residential uses on this side of the of I-85 and closer to the research park. We'd be glad to answer any questions. All right, are there any questions for the petitioner? Mr. Winston. <coughs> Ms. Winston. Ms. Mr. Winston. I just want to point out once again um, um, from the uh, presentation that Mr. 
uh, Mr. Brown made a couple of decisions ago, we really need to have to, we really have to um, find out a way uh, to coordinate with CMS um, as, as we make these land use plans. Um, uh, we're, we're making them in vacuums um, and they have real effects and, and we have to find a way to, to better collaborate. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, do I have a motion to close? Mr. Driggs, second by Mr. Graham. Um, Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Der Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Um, Ms. Johnson? Yes. All right, so hearing no other further objection, the next item on our agenda is item um, petition number 40. Um, petition 2020, I'm sorry, item number 40. Petition 2020. Dash 57 by Lakemont Property Investors for approximately 44 acres located west of 485 outs in our ETJ. Um, the current zoning is single family residential four units per Laker, acre in the Lower Lake Wiley protected area and Lower Lake Wiley critical area with an airport noise overlay. Proposed zoning is general industrial, Lower Lake Wiley protected area, Lower Lake Wiley critical area, and airport noise overlay. Staff recommends approval. The petitioner um, will have a presentation by the staff and followed by Mr. Brown representing the petitioner. Thank you. Uh, 2020 057, 44 acres, uh, as we mentioned. Uh, it's just off of Old Dow Drive. This actually is a, a petition that's separated into three uh, smaller portions of property. You can see those outlined uh, in, in the different slides, either in yellow or black, depending on what slide we're on. On this one, uh, you can see that they're outlined here in, uh, in a black outline. We've got the R4 areas that are highlighted. Uh, those are all R4 with Lake Wiley protective uh, overlay, as well as the Lake Wiley critical overlay, and also an airport noise overlay, so several Overlays are currently on the site and would be maintained through this rezoning as well. This is proposed to go I2CD. As you can see on the existing sl zoning slide, we have existing I2 and I1 uh, primarily around this property, uh, both adjacent to it and across Old Dowd Road and on the other side of 485. Uh, the adopted future land use for this property from, again, the Dixie Berry Hill Strategic Plan. In this case, does recommend office retail and light industrial uses for the site. Uh, while this is I-2, it is generally inconsistent, uh, but most of the uses that would be uh, considered more noxious or less compatible uh, with some of those adjacent to existing uses as well as the I-1 zoning have been uh, conditioned out. This proposal is for up to 600,000 square feet of industrial uses at the site with some restrictions, as we mentioned, on the types of uses. Uh, some of those prohibitions are adult establishments, adult, uh, or excuse me, automotive service stations and repair garages, car washes, dry cleaning, junkyards, storage of petroleum, landfill, quarries, uh, et cetera, as well as truck stops and terminals. Those are all prohibited uses as part of this conditional rezoning. Access to the site would be provided uh, along Old Dowd Road. Uh, we do have a 75-foot Class A buffer with a berm provided against all residential parcels, uh, as well as a commitment to preferred building materials for uh, the project. Again, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues uh, that we need to continue to work through. It is inconsistent with the Dixie Burial Strategic Plan uh, for office retail light industrial. However, it is uh, conditional uses uh, prohibit the more intense heavy uses in I-2. Uh, so it is a little more conducive with those recommended light industrial uses, uh, but just that zoning designation makes it uh, technically inconsistent. Uh, we do have industrial development occurring around the site uh, and adequate buffers to existing residential. Uh, and then uh, also we've got uh, that uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad line that runs through the site with a 200 foot right of way. Uh, so staff does recommend approval of this petition and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, following Mr. Brown's presentation. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Colin Brown, on behalf of the petitioner. I think Dave did a nice job on this. And just important to point out, uh, earlier tonight, uh, there was an extensive hearing on a um, an industrial petition uh, on this side of town. I would you know, distinguish this from that one. Uh, as you saw on the uh, zoning map, this is very much an industrial area, and the land use plan does call for industrial uses in this area. Uh, so we think that's appropriate. It's kind of filling in a donut hole, 
adjacent to the expressway. I can answer any questions you have. Are there any questions for Mr. Brown or for the staff? Yes. I don't have a question. I just wanted to reiterate what uh, Mr. Brown just said. Um, the residents, particularly those of the Northwest Community Alliance, did send a note in support of this particular petition. All right. Any other questions, comments? Do I have a motion to close? I have an second, Mr. Driggs, Mr. Graham. Um, all in favor, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Okay. Um, anyone object to closing of the public hearing? So now we'll move on to item number 41, rezoning petition 2020-060 by West Plan Investors for approximately 11.6 tenths acres located east of Interstate 85. Um, it's in District 4. The current zoning is commercial center. The proposed zoning is urban residential conditional. Staff recommends approval upon resolution of issues. And um, on this one, we have Mr. McVeigh and Brad Johnson available to present as well as the staff. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020-060, 11.65 acres. It's on Berkeley Place Drive and Wright Hill Road. Uh, this petition is requesting uh, to go from CC Commercial Center to UR2CD, Urban Residential. Uh, the Northeast District Plan from 1996 recommends office retail as well as office retail industrial warehouse and distribution for this site. Uh, the petition itself this evening proposes up to 198 multifamily dwellings and no more than eight buildings limited to 60 feet in height. Uh, primary access would be from Berkeley Place and Wright Hill Road, as you can see depicted by the red arrows on the slide. Uh, we do have an eight-foot planning strip, an eight-foot sidewalk along the frontage on Berkeley Place and Wright Hill Road, and then five-foot wide internal sidewalk network uh, between those buildings out to Berkeley Place and Wright Hill. Also a commitment to at least 6,000 square feet of programmed open space and architectural standards uh, for the buildings proposed within the project. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues related to technical revisions on transportation that need to be addressed. Uh, the residential use, residential use proposed in the plan is inconsistent with the Northeast District Plan. Uh, however, we feel that the existing residential development within that area that you can see just next door along Berkeley Place uh, makes this area a little bit more conducive to residential than some of the existing CC uses that were uh, initially approved for this property. Uh, those have never come to fruition, and over time we do have that R12 and R17 MFCD zoning that have uh, developed as multifamily projects, and we feel that that uh, would be continued to be appropriate through this petition. So again, staff does recommend approval, and we'll be happy to answer any questions following uh, presentation by the petitioners. Mr. McVean and, and Mr. Johnson, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Keith McVean with more of a now representing West Plan Investors. Uh, Brad Johnson with West Plan Investors is available to answer any questions. Uh, the WP Group Acquisitions is a uh, funded in 1994, a uh, well, uh, well, fully integrated multifamily development community of developer residential communities through, uh, throughout the Southeast, Atlanta, Athens, and Charleston and Charlotte, as well as Nashville and Houston. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Dave mentioned where the site was, just over 11 acres, currently zoned commercial center for retail and office uses as well as some, as, an adjacent economy control storage. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposal would allow the site to be developed with about 100, up to 198 multifamily units in four buildings arranged to uh, orient toward Berkeley Drive. Next slide, please. Uh, again, as Dave mentioned, a, a minimum of 6,000 square feet of, of, of common open space uh, with amenities. Uh, sidewalk improvements along Berkeley and Hill Drive. Uh, Hola will allow, uh, it's a good location as Dave mentioned for infill, for an infill community, residential infill community at, at this location. Was originally consistent with the Northeast District Plan. Original recommendation, those recommendations changed as, the, as subsequent rezoning as for office and retail. So this is going back to the original recommendation of the Northeast District Plan. Happy to answer any questions. All right, Ms. Johnson, would you like to start us off? I have no question. 
All right. Does anyone else have any questions? Hearing no one, I have Mr. Um, Drakes has made a motion to close. Mr. Eggleston has seconded. Um, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Bakari? All right. Ms. Johnson? We have enough to do. We have enough to close the public hearing. Does anyone object to the closing of the public hearing? If not, we're ready to move on to item 42, um, petition 2020-062 by I3I Ventures for approximately 17 acres located east of Old Statesville Road. It's in District 2. The current zoning is general industrial conditional and single-family residential, three units per acre. And the proposed zoning is uh, multifamily eight units per acre for res multifamily conditional as well as general business conditional. Staff recommends approval upon out resolution of outstanding issues. And in this case, we have um, two speakers for and a speaker in opposition. Um, and so Mr. Brown, um, Ms. Ad Mr. Adam Essick, Essink, and um, Louise Robinson, who is up in opposition. So, Dave, please. Okay, thank you. 2020-062 is just over seven acres. It's on both Old Statesville and Gibbon Road. Uh, the proposal is to rezone from both I-2 conditional, uh, the area in Brown along uh, both Old Statesville and Gibbon, as well as R-3, which is the yellow back on Gibbon Road, uh, to R-8 MFCD and B-2CD. And the R-8 would be where the R3 is and the B2 would be primarily where the I2 is. Uh, so as we look at the adopted future land use from the Northeast District Plan, uh, you can see that part of the pro property is recommended for heavy industrial uses. That was uh, as a result of a rezoning petition uh, that took that uh, property to the I-2 conditional that we currently have, uh, and then the uh, eight dwelling units per acre along Gibbon Road in Green uh, as part of that adopt a future land use plan as well. This proposal is to allow uses in B-2 and R-8, specifically permitted to be up to 280 residential units. Uh, within the B2 area, we would have uh, the, the kind of bulk of the residential units that would be permitted. Uh, the area that's being requested to go R8 would have units that would be consistent with eight dwelling units per acre. Uh, and again, there are some prohibitions on B2 uses in that B2 area. Uh, we do have some conversion rights that would be a part of this petition. Uh, should there be some uh, residential that doesn't get developed, some of that could be converted to some potential uh, commercial uses. Uh, again, there's eight foot planning strip and eight foot sidewalk along Old Statesville and Gibbon Roads. Uh, there would be a TIS required if the proposed development goes above the 2,500 trip threshold. Uh, that would be done during the permitting process. If they submit plans that generate more trips than 2,500, then they would need to do that uh, TIS before they could get any permits to construct. Uh, we do have screening uh, the BMPs that are proposed uh, with 36 inch tall shrubs, uh, as well as some architectural standards uh, for preferred building materials uh, and articulation. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some of those outstanding issues related to transportation that we still need to work through. Uh, it is consistent with the Northeast District Area Plan for residential up to eight DUA. Uh, it is inconsistent with that plan recommendation that was amended by the previous rezoning for industrial, but again, the original recommendation was for retail or B2 zoning uh, on that corner. So again, staff does recommend approval, and we'll be happy to take any questions following uh, Mr. Brown's presentation. All right, Mr. Brown and Mr. Essink. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner. I think Dave gave us a um, good overview of the plan, property location. Uh, I just did want to point out, we've talked a lot about industrial tonight. In this case, as we were talking about upzoning things to industrial. In this case, I just want to reiterate the bulk of this property here at the corner of Statesville and Gibbon is already zoned for heavy industrial uses. Um, our, this is the current rezoning plan, which allows 50,000 square feet of industrial machine equipment, uh, vehicle repair, outdoor storage. So again, these are heavy industrial uses that this property is currently entitled for. 
Um, don't think that's the best use of this land. This is a um, this is an industrial area. Here is um, Old Statesville Road. And you'll notice that there is a good bit of industrial being developed. This is the Metrolina Park that Beacon is currently developing. So there are more industrial uses coming. Um, I think as we talked about earlier tonight, a lot of the new industrial uses want larger acreage tracts. So we actually talked with some industrial developers in the area about the site and they said it was challenging for the warehousing for the logistics. Um, so this rezoning plan would actually be to downzone this from the industrial um, to a lighter district. We actually, if this sounds familiar, we actually had a hearing back in July where we talked about zoning this conventionally to that district. There was a speaker in opposition who talked about traffic concerns. So we converted this to a conditional rezoning plan so we could provide some greater detail. So now we have a conditional rezoning plan that you could see. Uh, the plan would be to uh, develop residential uses here. We have a maximum of 280 residential uses. We think good proximity to those good employment areas. There's a lot of industrial in the area, so this is some new housing in the area. Uh, we've gone to, I think, great extent to buffer the existing uses. So here's a look at our plan. You can see this is our main residential development. We also, as Dave mentioned, there are two zoning districts and to the rear of the site. Um, on the left-hand side of your screen, this would be the R8 area. So we're committing that would be a low density area, no more than eight units per acre, which is what the uh, land use calls for. We've got a restriction on building height back there closer to the existing single family. And as you can see, we also have a 50 foot class C buffer. And the area uh, on Gibbon Road that's in the R8, all of that up on Gibbon Road uh, would be green space and undeveloped area. So we think this is a good fit for the area. Uh, this is a look at the site plan transposed. We've had a number of community meetings. I think we've had maybe three virtual community meetings with neighbors. Um, and the bulk of the concerns we've had, almost almost the entirety of the concerns, have been about the condition of Gibbon Road. Uh, it is a narrow two-lane road uh, connecting this kind of 85 corridor with the Dorita neighborhood uh, to the east of this site. And so there's been great concern about that. Uh, Adam Essig with Kenley Horn is, is on the line, happy to, he's happy to answer questions. We continue to work with CDOT about some improvements in the area. We have a um, 2,500 trip threshold before a traffic study would be required. However, we are in discussions with CDOT about some improvements in the area, which will include some uh, improvements to Gibbon Road. Happy to answer any uh, questions you have. All right, Ms. is Ms. Robinson on the line? Ms. Ma Robinson? Madam Mayor. I'm sorry. Yes. Can I ask a procedural question before yes. the opposition speaks? Uh -huh. uh, a resident wanted to speak, but he didn't make the deadline to sign up to speak and wanted to know whether or not um, a registered speaker can yield some of his time to him. Is that permissible? On, that, is, that is not permissible that is not, per, rules. not permissible um, under the rules. But okay. it is perfectly great to send an email or a letter or even leave a voicemail that's foreign as that might be to some of us these days about this. So, and you can send it directly to the clerk's office and it can be distributed to the entire council, but we are not allowed to yield time. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. All right, Ms. Robinson. Yes, um, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the city council. I appreciate the opportunity for speaking to you, to you regarding this um, rezoning petition. Um, I, as, as you know, my name is Louise Robinson, and I am a longtime resident of Crater Park, which is a housing development just behind the proposed um, complex. Um, a project of this magnitude is going to have a tremendous impact on the surrounding community. I appreciate all the insight that the gentleman has provided, but the resources in this area will be strained, and this proposed plan is truly not aligned with the current housing and local development. And as I believe it was Mr. Brown mentioned, the traffic is is a huge factor. The design flaw with tr drivers trying to access I-77 and other roads in the area will be, will be um, problematic to people living in the area. Um, have, I understood that there has not been a traffic impact study done it's, um, from what I heard in the, the meeting and the, the gentleman that were talking prior to my 
being brought, you know, speaking. Um, and I just wondered what plans, I heard you say that there would be some improvements to Gibbon Road. And I wondered what those were, because there are some major um, public safety concerns that there's a school, an elementary school in the area, and we are concerned for public safety. Um, this densely populated neighborhood is really not aligned with the current single family um, development. So we would ask that um, if they could collaborate on some of those improvements they were talking about, we are, we are deeply concerned after speaking with a number of neighbors um, who have opposed the building of this densely populated housing. All right. Thanks. Um, Ms. Robinson is. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you had time to comp you have time to complete your statement. Um, yes, I, I did. My my neighbor that um, I believe you said it was not permissible for him. I was going to yield some of my time um, to allow him to talk, but since he's not able to, um, I think I'm through. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, so um, Mr. Um, Brown, you want to you have two minutes for rebuttal? Um, yes, and, and I'll just respond about you know the compatibility for this with the Crater Park neighborhood. Again, the existing zoning on the bulk of the site is for heavy industrial zoning. Uh, we think a residential use would be much more compatible uh, than that. And uh, in the areas adjacent to Crater Park, we are zoning that to R8, uh, which is a medium density zoning, no more than two stories of height and 50 foot buffers all around. Uh, so we try to be very intentional about the way we address that. The density is, is pressed up towards Statesville Road, which I think everyone recognizes much more heavily developed. Uh, I do also have on the line, um, I think Adam Essig with Kimley is working with CDOT. Um, Adam, you've probably just got just a minute, but um, someone may have a follow-up question for you. All right. So I, I have a question, is there, this is all rental property or is there any single family for sale property included in the rezoning? This would be a multifamily, it would be a kind of a typical apartment community. The second phase though is, is a lower density phase. It's, it's not townhomes, but would be restricted to two stories in height. So are they um, buildings that um, I think I've found a number of times that people have begun to take apartments and make, call them condominium apartments. So you sell like a four unit building or an eight unit building and to different people and investors. Is that what we're talking about? No, you know, this would be very much a traditional apartment community. Uh, the reason for the chain, the, the reason for that lower density is that the back half of the site, which is closer to Crater, Crater Park, we just lowered the density to their low, low level. This would be a you know, your traditional multifamily uh, community. Okay. All right. Any other questions, Mr. Graham? I, I think you're right. My mind, you, you kind of asked similar questions, so I, I think I'm good until um, I talk to both the developer and the uh, the neighborhoods um, prior to the um, final decision. Yeah, I am. Um, that, that area, I, I think I understand the traffic concerns, but I think more importantly, some of the concerns about how that development works and what it means for the overall um, future of that area. So, all right, so I have, um, do I have a motion to close? Second. Mr. Driggs, followed by Mr. Graham. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Newton? Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay, we're, the motion, the hearing is closed. The next petition is um, item number 43, petition 2020-72 by Freemore for approximately four, t approximately five tenths of an acre located north of Freedom Drive, south of Thrift. In District 3, the current zoning is um, I-1 industrial. The proposed zoning is mixed use development district optional. Staff recommends approval upon resolution of the issues. Um, and in this case, we have 
Um, no petition, no speakers in opposition, so we'll have the staff presentation followed by um, Mr. Colin Janess and Michael Moulton. Madam Mayor, we need someone to mute on there. Okay. Someone is, everybody muted. Okay, now. All right, so. We'll go ahead and begin. All right, thank you. 2020-072, uh, just under a half acre on Freedom Drive. Uh, the existing zoning for this petition is currently I-2. The proposed zoning is to go to mud conditional. Uh, the request is part of the Bryant Park land use and streetscape plan from 2007. It does recommend a mix of office, retail, and industrial uses for the site. Uh, this proposal is to allow most uses permitted in the mud district. Uh, we do have some prohibitive uses that are listed out. Um, it does propose also 10 residential units and limiting non-residential units up to 4,000 square feet. Uh, the proposal, the, the main point of it is to maintain the existing building uh, and reuse that building while allowing for an addition of a second floor above where some of those residential units would be constructed. Uh, optional provisions would include parking and maneuvering between the building and the Freedom Drive setback. That's essentially to maintain the existing uh, parking area in front of the building so we can continue to adaptively reuse that. Uh, and also to allow modified uh, sidewalk and planting strip width as well as quantity of street trees along Freedom Drive uh, as practical due to some of those existing streetscape conditions uh, along Freedom Drive. Uh, it does permit a maximum building height of up to 40 feet as well as all new lighting would be fully cut off uh, lighting fixtures and architectural designs as required by the MUD Zoning District. Uh, the staff does recommend approval of this petition. Do have some minor outstanding issues to resolve. Uh, <clears throat> it is inconsistent with the Bryan Park land use and streetscape plan for a mix of office, retail, and industrial. But mainly that inconsistency is the addition of those residential units above uh, this building that would be adaptively reused. Uh, so the, uh, the retail components, uh, any potential office components under the MUD district would be consistent. But uh, again, that second story residential would make it technically inconsistent with uh, the land use plan. But staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to answer any questions following petitioner's presentation. All right. Um, Mr. Janess and Mr. Moulton, you have three minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, members of city council and the zoning committee. Uh, we know we're getting late in the evening, so we thank you guys for allowing us to, to speak on this exciting project. Um, I think staff did a great job of outlining the petition. Um, I, sorry, I should probably... Um, Michael Moulton is also in line, um, can certainly answer any questions that you all have um, specifically for him. Uh, generally, uh, this petition is specific to allow for residential uses. It's an existing uh, roughly 10,000 square feet um, brick building that was used as a tire kind of auto shop. Um, the intent is to provide five residential units initially uh, with commercial space up to 4,000 square feet up front. Uh, we have the, or I guess we're including um, additional height for a potential future story. However, that's not planned right now. Um, so again, the current plan is for five residential units only. Uh, those optional provisions that were mentioned, uh, again, are really to allow for the adaptive reuse of the existing building and to try to help us maximize our parking. Um, we feel confident that we can meet the parking requirements of the MUD district. However, we certainly are going to continue to explore uh, whether it's shared parking or, or other avenues to, to try to increase that percentage. Um, I also just want to mention that we had two community meetings. Uh, the first community meeting, uh, we had a great turnout and some um, very great feedback. Um, also, probably some fair criticism in, in the sense of the information that was provided to the neighbors prior to the meeting and at that meeting. Um, we subsequently worked as a team to uh, update um, some building elevations, provide that to those neighbors, and then held a subsequent meeting at the beginning of September. Um, again, I think we had another great turnout and everybody was very uh, receptive to the additional information that we provided. Um, I don't want to take up too much time here, so I'm just going to open this up to questions if you guys have any. Ms. Botlington, do you have any questions? 
I don't. I was able to sit on these community uh, meetings, and I know that a lot of the residents had questions, and so we appreciate you having a second meeting and bringing it back, providing some more clarity for what exactly we would see there. Any, any questions for the petitioner or the staff? There are no questions. Mr. Driggs has a motion to close. Mr. Graham, second. Um, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Mr. Bakari? Yes. Thank you. The petition, the, the, gosh, I can't even talk anymore. Um, thank you very much. The public hearing is closed. The next item that we're going to is um, item 44, um, petition 2020-074 by Redwood USA for approximately 21 acres located off of Harris Houston Road in the university area in District 4. The current zoning is single-family residential with three units per acre. The proposed zoning is multifamily, eight units per acre, conditional residential. Um, in this case, we again have no one op in opposition, so we have the staff presentation followed by Mr. McVeigh and Bob Dyer, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020-074, just over 21 acres, primarily on Harris Houston Road. Uh, the existing zoning is R3. The proposed zoning is R8 MFCD. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the adopted future land use from the 96 Northeast District Plan does recommend single-family residential up to four DUA for the site. Uh, this proposal is for up to 83 single-family attached dwelling units, uh, as well as one leasing office and maintenance building. does cap the maximum height at 40 feet, uh, as well as a private uh, internal street network and driveway connections at Harris Houston Road, two car garages with each residential dwelling unit, as well as two spaces within the driveway along with guest parking near the leasing office. Uh, there is a provision to widen a portion of Harris Houston Road uh, and provide an eight foot planning strip and 12 foot multi-use path uh, in lieu of a five foot bike lane. Uh, the internal network will, uh, road network would have sidewalks that connect to entryways and to the proposed 12 foot multi-use path along the frontage of Harris Houston. Houston. Architectural standards are provided within the uh, proposal, uh, as well as the dedication of a 50-foot post-construction buffer uh, to Mecklenburg County Parks and Rec for construction of a future greenway. That's the area that uh, you can see outlined there in blue. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition, and we do have some outstanding issues related to transportation, environment, site and building design. Uh, the multifamily housing type is inconsistent with uh, the recommendation for single-family residential, but it is consistent with the plan's density recommendation. So again, we're looking at just a difference in housing type, but density is consistent with uh, that adopted area plan from 96. And again, staff does recommend approval, and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. All right, Mr. Brown, Mr. Mandel, Mr. Reeking, and Mr. Whalen. You have three minutes. Uh, sorry, Mayor, I think you have the wrong Oh, I am oh, so sorry, Mr. McVeigh and Mr. Dyer, and I just said that a few minutes ago. Sorry about that, Mr. McVeigh. Thank you, Mayor, and we'll be brief. I'll keep McVeigh assisting Redwood, Redwood USA uh, with more Van Allen. Uh, Bob Dyer is on the line with us as well. Uh, as Dave mentioned, this is a rezoning for 21 acres from R3 to R8 and FCD to allow 83 single story uh, multifamily units. Mr. Dyer is actually going to run through the presentation for you, and then we'll be happy to answer questions. Great. Thanks, Keith. Uh, uh, as Keith said, my name's Bob Dyer with uh, Redwood USA, Madam Mayor, members of City Council, and the Zoning Committee. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss uh, our new potential Redwood neighborhood on Harris Houston Road. Um, Next slide. Um, Redwood is uh, building right now in approximately seven, seven states. Uh, we're located in both South and North Carolina. Uh, we've got a, uh, a community under construction just up the road um, uh, from us that some of you may have been involved with in a, re, uh, it was an R3 rezoning about, uh, about two, two years ago. Um, right now, we are uh, we 
own and manage 13,000 dwellings across these these uh, seven seven states. And the thing I guess we're most proud of is that we've uh, we've never sold a product that we've built um, and managed. Uh, next slide, please. So. Uh, uh, who lives in um, in our Redwood communities? The, the largest group of folks living in our communities are empty nesters, uh, followed by young professionals. We have very few families with children. Typically, in a hundred dwelling community, we rate, we have about ten to thirteen um, school age children. Next slide. What do we build? Okay, we build, as, as it was mentioned, these are single story units. Each dwelling has a two car attached garage. Um, next slide. Okay, the site, uh, if, if we think of the site as a V or a triangle, Harris Houston Road is along the top. There's approximately 2000 feet of frontage, uh, that's where we're putting the multi-use uh, uh, multi uh, path. Uh, to the southwest or to the left, there is a large transmission line uh, and a Duke power easement. And then on the southeast or to the right, there's a creek with the buffer um, that we'll be providing to the county. Next slide. Is that I'm available to answer any I'm questions. sorry. Yes, thank you oh. very much. I appreciate that. Um, so, Ms. Johnson, do you have any questions? Yes, I, I just wanted to say I've um, worked closely with the, uh, the developer and with the uh, representative, and I wanted to thank CDOT. Um, I reached out to Lakeisha and um, her team regarding some of the residents' concerns um, regarding sidewalks in that area. So I wanted to thank them that they were uh, available. Uh, I know she's at the meeting. They they are here and they're thanked. Okay, all right. Well, I didn't know if, she, if there was any input regarding sidewalks in that area that she wanted to add, but um, I don't have any questions right now for the builder. All right, are there any other questions? Move close. I have a motion to close and a second by Mr. Graham, Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Um, Mr. Winston? Yes. Ms. Um, Johnson? Yes. All right, the hearing is closed um, by unanimous support, unless Your someone objects. Your favorite word, Mayor. Hmm? Your favorite word's coming on this next one. My favorite words are what? On this next petition. Oh my God, Natomy is here again. Natomy. <laughs> Not Amy. <laughs> time. Oh, Colin, thank you so much for helping me remember how to pronounce this. I really appreciate that. Okay, so rezoning petition 2020-075 by Natomy Holmes, approximately 19 acres located on the south side of Ridge Road, um, west of Mallet Creek in District 4, the current zoning is single family with three units per acre. The requested zoning is single family, multifamily, eight units per acre. Residential conditional staff recommends approval upon um, resolution of um, any issues. And um, we'll hear from the staff. And then we'll hear from Mr. Brown, Mr. Mandel, Mr. Reiking, and Mr. Whalen. All right, thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020 19.6 acres. It's on Ridge Road. Uh, the existing zoning is R3. Uh, the proposed zoning is R8 MFCD. You can see just next door we've got uh, an R8 MFCD parcel uh, that was rezoned and would be connected to this one uh, via the road network. Uh, the adopted future land use for this project is from Prosperity Hux Area Plan in 2015. It does call for residential uses up to 4 DUA. Uh, this project would be for up to 139 townhome units. The density for this project would be 7.1 dwelling units per acre, so uh, slightly over the recommended uh, 
uh, density in that Prosperity Hux area plan. Uh, we do have a 10-foot uh, sidewalk and 8-foot planting strip along the frontage of Ridge Road, uh, as well as uh, streetscape requirements according to the Prosperity Hux area plan. Uh, we do have a left turn lane into the site that would be uh, provided on Ridge Road, uh, as well as three stub connections for future development uh, and one connection to the adjacent development that's there on Lilac Grove Drive. Uh, we do have internal sidewalk commitments and pedestrian connections throughout the site. Uh, all right of way would be dedicated uh, to the city uh, through fee simple conveyance. We do have a class C buffer where we abut single family zoning. Uh, building material commitments are part of the conditional notes uh, as well as uh, garage units being provided uh, for all town units for a minimum of one car. And then all sidewalks will be provided to connect uh, any drives with proposed streets. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. Again, we do have some outstanding issues related to transportation and environment to work through. Uh, it is consistent with the recommendation of residential uses, but just slightly over that density recommendation of up to four DUA. Uh, we do have that R8 CD next door, which uh, would allow for this to kind of infill and provide some of that continued transition as we get closer there to I-485 and Mallard Creek Road. Uh, so again, staff does feel like uh, it's a, an appropriate project in this location, and we do recommend approval, and we'll be happy to take any questions following Mr. Brown's presentation. All right, Mr. Brown. Madam Mayor, Colin Brown on behalf of Mattamy, thank you. Uh, also have um, the ESP engineering team and a representative from Mattamy on. I think they did a fantastic job, so we'll just be happy to answer any questions you have. All right, Ms. Johnson, this is in your district. Do you have any um, questions? No, I don't. All right. Anyone else have questions? Move to close. Mr. Driggs and Mr. Graham have moved yes. to close the public hearing. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Eisel? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Mr. Bakari? Yes. Thank you. The, um, Anyone object to closing the public hearing? Thank you. We'll move to the next item, which is um, item number 47. 46. 46. You're right. We have no speakers on 46. All right. Yeah, we'll just have somebody from the airport to answer any questions. All right. Did we have anyone to do it? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no item 46, petition 2020-078 by the city for aviation. Approximately 19 and a half acres located on the north and south of Old Out Road, just west of 485, outside the city limits. Current zoning is light industrial lower lake Wiley protected area. Um, single family residential, rent three units an acre, lower lake Wiley protected area. Proposed zoning is I-2, general industrial, lower lake Wiley protected area. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Um, we have a staff presentation. Yeah, just a brief one. It's 19 and a half acres. Uh, it is located uh, right there on uh, the I-485 area, uh, and I uh, believe that's Old Dowd Road. Yeah, Old Dowd Road. Uh, the existing zoning is I-1 and R-3. Uh, the proposed zoning is I-2 conventional. This is our only conventional rezoning we had this evening. So. Uh, this is, again, just a straight I-2 use. The Dixie Berry Hill uh, strategic plan calls for a mix of office retail and light industrial. Uh, this is, again, an I-2 zoning, so it would allow some uh, more intense industrial uses than the light industrial recommendation, so it is technically inconsistent with that plan, but uh, this is an area that uh, we feel industrial is appropriately located in. Uh, adopted future land use all around it is industrial, right across from the airport. Uh, again, staff does recommend approval. There's no conditional plan, so no outstanding issues to speak of, uh, and I believe uh, we do have someone from the airport to answer any questions, uh, should there be any. All right, are there any questions concerning the petition? Mr. Driggs? Just a, a quick comment. This is yet another inconsistent Dixie Hill, Dixie Berry Hill strategic plan. Feels like the majority tonight have not been consistent. So I just hope we're going to move fast to put some sort of a plan environment in place that doesn't put us in this position of winging it on every single petition. But otherwise, I have no comments, and if nobody else does, I move to close. I just say that, you know, sometimes we, the airport has a plan. Mm -hmm. And the Dixie Hill Berry Hill plan was what, 2003? And so maybe sometimes we allude to a plan that has been already superseded by another plan. 
but I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly the case, but I mean, the airport has come forward with a development plan for a while. And a it's recent um, current. Yes, Mr. Winston? Um, I, you know, I, I concur with Mr. Driggs, and that's one of the points I made tonight on the, on the earlier one. Um, we still don't have a way to kind of analyze how those plans work together. Where is the overlays? What, what, you know, we're, we're still left kind of winging it. So I think what Mr. Drake said is, is completely relevant. Um, and what you said is completely relevant, but we need more guidance from staff of how to, how to reckon those two things. All right, so we have a motion to close by Mr. Driggs, second by Mr. Graham, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Mr. Bakari? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, hearing no other objections, we'll close that public hearing. Um, for that amendment. The next item is item number 47. I'm sorry, yes. did someone say something? Yes, did we decide we're going past 10? Um, we have two more petitions that neither have objections, so I'd like okay. to go ahead and get the last two done. Agreed. Agreed. Does anyone have any objection to that? That's fine, I just, we didn't. I'm sorry, I, I it's 10.04, you're right. I didn't notice it was 10.04. I've been having so much fun. Um, <laughs> item 47, um, petition 2020-080 by the courtyard at Park Road for approximately 2.3 acres located on the west side of Park Road. Um, it's in District 1. Current zoning is neighborhood business. Proposed zoning, neighborhood service. Staff recommends approval of this. We have a staff presentation. And then we'll hear from Mr. Carmichael and Mr. Percy if they have a question of earth their questions okay thank you madam mayor 2020 080 uh 2.376 acres existing shopping center on park road uh existing zoning is b1 the proposed zoning is ns uh it's part of the dilworth land use and streetscape plan does recommend residential office retail for the site uh, this is really just a rezoning uh, to maintain the existing shopping center, but allow some uh, additional square footage for eating, drinking, the entertainment establishments, as well as outdoor dining patios, uh, prohibit drive-through and service lane windows, uh, no real expansions to the building itself. It's just for some of that outdoor seating area, uh, and also uh, just to comply with some of the parking arrangements that would be a result of any potential addition of some EDE uses on the site. Uh, I'll let uh, Mr. Carmichael answer any questions specific about the plans for the building, but it's really just to maintain the existing shopping center and add some additional EDE uses primarily for that outdoor seating space. Staff does recommend approval. Uh, we do have some outstanding issues just for some transportation and technical revisions. It is consistent with the Dilworth uh, land use and streetscape plan and staff does recommend approval. We'll take any questions should you have any. All right, uh, Mr. Carmichael and Mr. Purser. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council and Zoning Committee. I'm John Carmichael, and Bob Purser is here as well. I'll be brief. They did a very thorough job. There are no, the, there, there's currently 34,000 square feet of gross floor area in the shopping center. That would continue to be the case. Uh, next slide. If this rezoning petition is, next slide. Thank you. If this rezoning petition is approved, likewise, the uses allowed in NS are the same uses allowed in B1, so the uses would not change, or the allowed uses would not change as a result of this uh, rezoning petition. The sole purpose of this rezoning petition is to really allow the petitioner to propose parking standards that are different than those required under the B1 zoning district. The NS allows a little, little more flexibility. The parking standards being proposed by the petitioner are more stringent than those that would be allowed in the Anasoni district. And as Dave said, the petitioner would really like the ability to add another restaurant use to this location. Uh, this rezoning petition does cap the amount of restaurant space that could be located in the site on the site, and that would be 85, 50 square feet, and it limits the size of outdoor dining patios. Uh, the, the parking ratio would be one for 375 square feet for retail service and office uses, and the parking standards for EDEE uses, which are restaurant uses, would be one per 225 square feet. 
Uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, are there any questions? Mr. Eggleston has motion no questions. Mr. 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 Motion to close. Mr. Drake second. Mr. Got a hand up on I'm right sorry. Up. Mr. Winston has his hand up. Ms. Winston. Ms. Winston. Mr. Winston. I thought you said Ms. Winston. I was like, okay. Mr. Winston? No, I'm taking that down. That's all. Oh, no, I didn't, even have, I didn't even have it up. <laughs> Motion to close. All right, we have a motion and a second by Mr. Driggs. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Oh, yeah. Ms. Ajmira? Ms. B Mr. Bakari? Yep. All right, that's a motion to close the public hearing. The next item on our petition, our, our last item on the agenda. No, I'm sorry. It is not the last item. 48. Um, tr petition 2020-084 by D.R. Horton for approximately nine acres located on the west side of Reams Road. It's in District 2. The current zoning is single-family residential with three units an acre. The proposed zoning is conditional multifamily residential, eight units per acre. Staff recommends approval upon resolution of issues. And um, we have no speakers, so um, the staff will do their presentation. All right, thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020-084 is just over nine acres on Reams Road. Uh, it is requesting R3 to R8 MFCD. Uh, as you can see, we have R3 behind and all around, and then we also have industrial zoning uh, along Reams Road and North Park Boulevard. Uh, this petition is part of the Northwest District Plan, which is 1990. That calls for single-family residential at up to four DUA. Uh, the proposal is for up to 72 uh, for-sale townhome units, which would come in at a density of eight DUA. Uh, access would come off of Reams Road. There'd be an eight-foot planning strip and six-foot sidewalk along the road frontage there. Uh, Five-foot bike lane and an 11-foot center lane along the Reams Road frontage would also be installed as part of this project. Uh, we'd have sidewalks along all streets, as well as a street stub on the northeastern part of the development for any kind of future connection uh, to adjacent development should that occur. I uh, also have a small park with landscaping and hardscaping proposed within the project, uh, buffers abutting the, the residentially zoned land, uh, and then also buffers that is, uh, abutting that industrial zone land down there to the south. Uh, we would not have any proposed connection to Parliament Court, so we wouldn't be uh, getting into that neighborhood for any kind of connectivity. One car, one car garage for each unit, as well as architectural standards, are being provided as part of the plan. Staff does recommend approval. Uh, we do have some outstanding issues related to transportation. Uh, it is inconsistent with that Northwest District Plan from 1990, but it is consistent with the general development policies, which support the density of up to eight DUA. Uh, so again, staff does recommend approval, and we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, should you have any. All right, Mr. Graham, are there any questions for the staff? Close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion to close the second. public hearing second. and a second. Um, Ms. Watlington? Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Newton? Ms. Johnson? Yes. Um, so we have a sufficient amount. Um, if there are no objections, we'll close that public hearing. This is our final petition, um, item number 49. Um, petition 2020-087 by Plainwood for approximately 7.7 and 8 tenths of an acre located on the east side of Brookshire Boulevard. It's in Council District 2. The single family residential um, five units per acre is the current zoning. The proposed zoning is multifamily residential conditional 12 units per acre. Staff recommends approval upon um, resolution of issues. And we have um, two speakers in addition to the staff, or I'm sorry, three speakers in addition to the staff. Uh, Mr. Carmichael, Mr. Frombach, and Mr. Davis will follow the staff presentation. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. 2020-087, our last petition of the evening, approximately 7.81 acres. It's off Brookshire Boulevard on Plainwood Drive, uh, just off Dakota Street and Black Avenue. Uh, the existing zoning is R5, and the proposed zoning is R12 MFCD. Uh, the uh, adoptive future land use comes from two separate plans uh, with, a, with this project. That's from Thomasboro Hoskins Area Plan, which is from 2002. 
Uh, that plan calls for residential up to five DUA, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and then the Northwest District Plan, which is from 1990, calls for single family residential at up to six DUA. Uh, this proposal is for a 93 attached townhome dwelling units, as well as any accessory uses allowed in R12MF. Uh, does commit to include a right turn lane on Brookshire Boulevard into the proposed site, uh, internal public street and private street networks, a 12-foot multi-use path along the Brookshire Boulevard frontage, 8-foot planting strips, 6-foot sidewalks along Plainwood Drive and Black Avenue, which would actually be improved. It's currently just a uh, paper right-of-way at this point. They would actually construct uh, Black Avenue to continue between Plainwood and Dakota. Uh, we have landscape buffers next to single-family zoning around the site. Uh, as well as limiting individual units to five or fewer. Uh, each unit would have a garage and each unit would also have a covered front stoop. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues to work through related to transportation and environment. Uh, part of the property, the western portion, is inconsistent with Thomasboro Haskins area plan. Uh, that's up to five DUA. Eastern portion is inconsistent with Northwest District Plan, uh, recommended up to six DUA. However, again, both of these plans are uh, uh, apply the general development policies, uh, which does support residential uses at up to seven DUE. So we are consistent with general development policies and the density recommended for those. Uh, so staff does recommend approval and we'll be happy to answer any questions following Mr. Carmichael, uh, his presentation. Thank you. Mr. Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Madam Mayor, for attendance, members of the city council and the zoning committee, I'm John Carmichael and I'm working with with me tonight are Nicole Frombach of Ryan Holmes and Bob Davis, site engineer. Uh, Dave did a very thorough job, so if we could just switch, flip forward to the uh, site plan, I'll be really brief. Uh, next slide, next slide, next slide. Um, but the, the purpose of the rezoning request is to accommodate a townhome community that can contain up to 93 uh, townhome units. Uh, as Dave said, there would be buffers along the southern and eastern boundaries of the site, and then a buffer along the site's western boundary as well, adjacent to Hampshire Boulevard. Petitioner would complete the street network by improving Black Avenue, which is like, which bifurcates the eastern portion of the site, and Plainwood Drive, 12-foot um, multi-use path once again on Brookshire Boulevard, and 8-foot plain strips and 6-foot sidewalks along the street frontages. Um, access to the site would be from Plainwood and Black Avenue. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. We appreciate, I appreciate you going beyond 10 p.m. too, I really do. All right, um, Mr. Graham, do you have any questions? Yes, I have about uh, 40 of them, so bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's 39. <laughs> uh, uh, Close public hearing. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a um, close um, for the closing of the public hearing. Mr. Eggleston, Mr. Graham, Mr. Biggs, yes, yes. Ms. Yes, Watlington, yes. Mr. Winston, Mayor Pro Tem, Ms. Ajmira. Um, yes. uh, that's a majority. Motion the to close the meeting. Um, we have motion to adjourn, and um, we're. Um, okay. I wanted to actually say. Thank you for um, staying the extra 15 minutes. I think it makes a big difference when we have to go forward in the next week. And I want to say thank you for the attentiveness to the meeting. Um, our next meeting is um, September the 28th. And um, hopefully we'll all be able to attend and participate. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye.